All right, man. Welcome back to the Former Action Guys podcast, Charlie Benbo. Third time on the show. I, yep. uh, you know, it's you've you've done so many things over your career that it's taken this long to get to the part <laughs> where I think a lot of people that knew you from Angle Code, this is probably what they're waiting on is for you to come in and talk about your time there and stuff, which is uh, interesting that you went to Angle Code because you're an infantry officer, which is not yeah. an, a common thing, which I you know, kind of baffled why it's not more common. I think that's definitely a good uh, base of knowledge. It should be at the unit to help kind of shape training and stuff like that in the operations section. So anyway, we'll, we'll get into all that, I guess. But if you want to go ahead and introduce yourself, maybe for the people that haven't gone back and listened to the episodes, I believe it was 93 and 95. I'll, I'll say it correctly in the intro. I'll look it up um, yeah. and they can hear all up and to that point. But if you want to give us a, you know, a little summary of all that. Yeah, cool. I mean, uh, infantry officer for uh, 20 years now, uh, about to retire in May. Um, and, uh, you know, did nine deployments, uh, three as a lieutenant, and then I went to Anglico, did two more there uh, before doing a mid company command, all that good stuff. So, uh, you know, nine total, what, uh, five total to combat zones, so four to Iraq, one to Afghanistan. Uh, got the, the good fortune to be a JTAC for. I, I'm about to hit my uh, 15 year mark. Crazy. Uh, yeah, I think right. Yeah, that's right. A lot of guys lose so, that designation or that qualification after they leave, like Anglico, right? Like the officer side. Yeah. yeah. Dude, I got lucky, and then uh, I also just couldn't let it go. <laughs> you have to I work mean, for talk, it. Yeah, I mean, I I just managed to like find little opportunities here and get lucky. Um, so we could talk more about that uh, on down the road. Um, but yeah, um, I think we finished when I was coming back from Afghanistan. I've been a rifle platoon commander for two deployments at that point. I did the invasion of Iraq and then turned around four months later and went to Afghanistan. Um, actually, while we're on the topic, there's a book that just came out called The Hardest Place. That's all about the valley where I spent some of the time in uh, Afghanistan. Uh, really good book. So Let's it doesn't check it out. My, like my platoon doesn't get mentioned in there. Like we're barely a footnote in that whole story. You know, we spent a, we we spent two months at Camp Blessing. You know, there are army units that spent like sixteen months there. Yeah. Um, but uh, really cool to see because that guy did a ton of research on the backstory on why, like, you know, American units went into the valley in the first place, uh, and it got to be a pretty, pretty violent place. Like a lot of the you know, uh, Operation Red Wings with uh, the SEALs and uh, Marcus Luttrell mm -hmm. was in that area. You know, the Corongo Valley. Uh, was near there. Uh, the Camp Blessing, where I started out, it kind of became the hub of everything that happened in that area. Um, so if you ever hear about, you know, like I said, Operation Red Wings, um, Corgo Valley was, uh, I think it was Restrepo was the, yeah, yeah, the uh, documentary about it. So uh, it's a really interesting book if anybody's into reading about that area. It is always uh, cool when you have a book out about an area that you've been in. You know, a book yeah. like that you can relate to. And you're like, oh, I remember that, you know, piece of terrain that they're talking about. Well, I actually didn't know. So, I mean, I, I mentioned that we were there working with an ODA. Uh, it was a National Guard ODA. And the book actually talks very favorably about them. Like, they, they did the coin slash unconventional warfare thing really well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I know the book thinks very highly of, and the guy who wrote the book thinks very highly of what they did there. Um Matter of fact, I didn't know about this. I wasn't there at the time, but the uh, the ODA commander, uh, towards the end of their deployment, the like key was out on a patrol in the village near their base where they made a lot of relationships, and a dog started coming at him like you know dogs in that part of the world do. Mm -hmm. So he shot the dog. Um, bullet, you know, being being an Afghan dog, like bullet goes right through, hits a rock, ricochets, and hits a villager, oh, right, right, right in the head. Too, and kills him instantly. oh my god really jeez yeah so and so ron like feels terrible uh <laughs> yeah. i think I, i'd have to go back I, he may have actually even known the guy that he accidentally killed but uh you know oh, the villagers didn't blame him one bit they blamed the dog really uh, and i was actually talking to a guy at work who was there when this happened uh he's like yeah that that night they started killing all the dogs in, in the village holy crap they what, completely blamed it on the dog. What a weird place, man. What a weird yeah. place. I bet the U.S. still paid them, though, right? I'm sure they you know, still got some money Something. from the U.S. for it. That's 
Isn't it weird how you just kind of talk about it? Like, yeah, it's just, it's just kind of a thing that happened. Dude got shot. Yeah. Like, it ricocheted and hit him in the head. Like, I had a buddy tell yeah. me about they, you know, during the uh, early days in Iraq when they were still trying to figure out, like, the best way to do VCPs, you know, without lighting them up immediately for running wires and stuff like that. And, you know, they started using pin flares. And um, he said one time they – they were out and they had like a checkpoint or something set up or they had a had a, the road barricaded and the car kept coming or something like that. Shot a pin flare and it bounced off of him. He I don't know if he shot it or not. I don't want to get this incorrect. But anyway, he shot the pin flare, bounced off the ground and hit some dude in a wheelchair and caught him on fire. I'm oh, like, shit. oh my God, dude. Like, yeah, you know, and that's one of those things where obviously – that's a super shitty situation and the Iraqis are going to be like, what the fuck, you know, like, but it's one of those things where you couldn't even, I mean, unless someone said that, like just now, how, how would you ever even consider that? Like, Oh yeah. Pin flare bounce off the ground and catch a dude on fire in a wheelchair. Like, yeah. Right. That's the weird shit that happens on like combat deployments that you just regular people could like never understand, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. That's crazy. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, interesting reading. Uh, if anybody gets a chance to take a look at that book, like it just came out uh, earlier this month, uh, and I, I bought it on Kindle immediately. Um, so we get back off that deployment. Um, that was May two thousand four. We got back, um, and knew we were going to be chopping to a mu after that, which was I was not super thrilled about. Um, you know, because we knew that we were. You know, I I, I deployed two two times very rapidly. Uh, and wanted to go right back out for round three. Like I didn't want to sit back in the States and do a PTP. I wanted to go right back into the fight. Mm -hmm. Um, and then I also found out I was going to become the H and S company XO when I got back, uh, which is, yeah, it's the least coveted position in the battalion for an infantry officer. Um, so I had, uh, they kind of dangled a couple of times. I'd heard rumors that I was going to go be a combined anti-armor platoon commander, Mm -hmm. which is the most coveted position. And oh, really? Had a, yeah. Like, there were rumors going around. I heard it from my company commander, the weapons company commander. Uh, a couple of my NCOs had heard it. Uh, and then we get back, and uh, they do a battalion officer's call, and they're announcing the slate, and the, you know, the battalion commander comes over and he goes, hey, Charlie, uh, I'm going to make you making the H&S company XO. It's just like, oh. So. So you stab your uh, it, a little bit. That's funny. Why? Oh, yeah, no, real I, quick, before I, you go on, why is the cat platoon commander, like, the – or? Why is that like the most coveted? I mean, it's one, it's a mounted platoon. If those people who don't know anything about it, you know, you're, you're mounted in a Humvees uh, with about 30 to 40 Marines. Um, so you're kind of a cool mission there. You've got heavy machine guns, usually a, a mix of 50 cals and, and Mark 19s, uh, plus the tow missile launchers. Um, and you're also generally an independent platoon. Like you work, you know, the weapons company commander is the fire support coordinator for the battalion. So he's mm-hmm. usually in the battalion COC. He's not maneuvering a company, so you usually get tasked directly by the battalion. Uh, so you work kind of independently, um, which is why they generally, generally try to put senior lieutenants in there. Um, and it's just seen as a, a you know, one, it's another shot at platoon command instead yeah. of being an XO. Um, so it, it generally seems like as a good thing, you know, whereas XO is like, you know, you're the, the admin guy. You deal with all the behind-the-scenes administration of the company, you know, accounting for all the stuff. Um, <laughs> all you know, the you, paperwork, yeah. Your job's to do all the behind-the-scenes stuff so the commander can go out and, you know, stand in front and strike a leadership pose <laughs> or the, the Marines and, you know, all that stuff. Yeah. So it's even even a line company exit is not generally seen as a an exciting thing, but at least in a line company, you still get to go to the field with the, the company. You still get to kind of mold the new lieutenants coming in. You know, h and company, you don't really get any of that. Um, you are just managing uh, the herd of cats that is headquarters and service company. Um, that sucks, too, because lot- there's a very short window for officers to get to go out and do the so-called, you know, cool stuff before you yeah. become a staff dude. Yeah, and it, uh, that'll probably be some of the motivation for my some of my later decisions. But um, I mean, it ended up honestly being a good thing. Um one, I, I did learn a lot. I know that you know, when the CEO told me, like, hey, we're, I'm, this is what I'm doing, he's like, hey, normally this is seen as kind of a negative thing, but I'm, I'm doing it because I, I need somebody 
uh, with good organizational skills, and it's going to help you down the line. You're going to learn a lot about how the time functions. None of that really sunk in at the time because I was just pissed off. And mm. I think I let the officers call as soon as I could. <laughs> uh, but uh, honestly, I, I did learn a ton about how the battalion function. Um, the uh, the company commander that I ended up working for, an h and company, uh, is easily in the top three bosses that I've had in my entire career. Oh, that's uh, nice. Just phenomenal guy to work for. Um, the company gunny was phenomenal. Uh, great staff and CEO to work with. Um, so he and I had a pretty tight type on and, and got on really well. Um, and honestly, like being a live platoon commander on, on two deployments, like kind of a chip on my shoulder that was a little bigger than it should have been. Uh, and it was kind of, it, it probably needed to get knocked off. So it was good to get over to h and company, you know, cause I went over the typical like, ah, uh, you know, don't want to go slum with the pogues and all that. And I, I got over there and I, you know, I learned how hard those dudes work. Uh, like the guys in the motor pool, the guys in supply, like, you know, I mean, I was putting in pretty long hours uh, and generally leaving, you know, after dark. But I tell you what, the lights were always on in supply when I was leaving, you know. Very, and, very uh, le- least appreciated people, man. I remember being in the motor T and just being like, no oh, yeah. one cares about us. <laughs> like no one. And I was with MLG. So when I was in Iraq and stuff, it was just turning wrenches on your shift all day. And, oh, yeah. then, and then after I lat moved and I was with three, six, I remember being in Marja and going over and talking to the mechanics a couple times, just cause I felt bad for them. I'm like, man, you guys, all you do is fix other people's fuck ups and you never get to like, go do it yourself. You never get to go drive around and stuff. You're too busy fixing everybody else's mistakes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I got on really well with the uh, the other lieutenants in H and S company, the uh, you know the Camo, the Four Alpha, all those types. Um, so I made some good friends there. I mean, like the engineer platoon commander, you know, the Adj and the, the Camo were my roommates on the ship. So that was all beneficial. Um, I did try to pop smoke from the battalion <laughs> when I found out. Um, you know, I told my platoon sergeant, I got back down to my platoon, I was like, yeah, this is what happened. And, you know, I already was looking for a, a deployment. So he's like, hey, let's let's go over to Small Craft Company, see, because uh, he had just come from there. So I went over and met the CEO of Small Craft Company. He's like, absolutely love to have you. Um, and uh, he tried to bring me on, put in a by name request through division, and, and the battalion shot it down. Like, no, we're not giving him up. So uh, I get to spend the rest of my time in HS there. Did, did that make you even more bitter? You're like, damn it. Like, this is my A little out. bit. A little bit. Um, yeah, it was definitely, so a couple of good things. Like, I was, you know, I was feeling sorry for myself one day, like, walking over the armory, because I had a, a mess on my hands getting the armory mm-hmm. uh, back in shape. Uh, we had some, you know, issues with not having everything accurate on our uh, CMR, the the for anybody that doesn't know what that is, it's the document that lists all your serialized gear, your weapons, your optics, all that stuff. Uh, so getting all that, you know, lined up and make sure everything reflected accurately what we had on hand. And I'm walking out of the armory one day. And now I'm going to spend a couple hours over there just going through things, and feeling down. And my old rifle platoon's in formation next to the battalion CP. And I heard, you know, something like, good morning, sir, good afternoon, sir. And I look over and they're, they're all... Uh, you know, the, the, my old radio operator was out front uh, in front of the platoon and called them to attention. They were saluting as I went by. I was I was well outside of, you know, 30 paces or whatever it was. I was like, oh, that's cool. Yeah, that's cool. Um, actually, before I gave up the platoon, you know, I'd made a random comment to my platoon sergeant once that I picked up corporal, but I'd never got an NCO sword. Uh, so I come down to the office one day. He's like, hey, sir, we need you outside for a second. He grabs an NCO sword and starts walking out the door. I'm like, huh. Are we doing close order drill? Like, what's up? And uh, so he goes out, calls the platoon to attention, turns around and, and presents a sword to me. He goes, hey, the boys wanted to get you this. Um, so he said you never had one, so everybody chipped in and got you one. Oh, that's cool. So, oh, wow. Those are pricey, too. That's that's a nice gift. Yeah. Yeah. So those things kind of help soften the blow of going H&S. And then, like I said, working for uh, for now Colonel Bop, like that, that dude, uh, just a great – great attitude about everything. Um, so, and, and made it, made it a lot more tolerable to work for him uh, yeah. every day. He's just, he was never, never spun up about anything. Always had a very positive attitude. Um, and so that was kind of infectious. 
uh, I think with the rest of us there in the, the H and S company staff. It definitely um, makes you. Then, it definitely makes you a more well-rounded like leader when you get that exposure to other elements. You know the logistics side and kind of figure out the processes to get things done. So when you go back to the operational side, you can grease the wheels a little easier to make things happen. Dude, it was scary how little I knew when I got there. Like I go to my first XO meeting with the battalion XO and he's rattling off like all these things. I'm, I'm writing down a list. I had to go to the, the S4 and be like, what do these mean? What is yeah. he talking about? Arrow, arrows and aerosols, which you oh, know yeah. a lot of the newer guys won't know what those are, but some yeah. of the older guys will. Um, so yeah, we we did that. We did our MU workup. Um, you know, I, I talked to a buddy who'd been on a previous MU, and he's like, "It's like being deployed at home." Uh, I was like, "Yeah, I mean, you're you're gone every couple of weeks, um, on ship for a couple of weeks at a time." Uh, so we did all that through the winter. Um, what else? I think that's about the time I started talking to the monitor too. Like, hey, I, I had a. I'd taken some additional tuition money in college, so I actually had a five-year contract. Mm -hmm. And so I knew I had some time left. I was like, you know what? I'll probably just take another set of orders and, and do something to see what's out there. And so I was, I was looking for more deployments, wanted to get back out. So I was like, yeah, I'll see what I can I can find for deployable uh, billets that are out there to, to go out and do some more cool things while I got some time left. So I went and talked to the monitor. And it gave me this list, and I'm looking down at it, and it's got all the standard stuff on it. And there's just one that says, Anglico, second Anglico, which I didn't know a whole lot about. I, I remember like when I was in high school or maybe college, a guy I knew, a guy I knew who had joined the Marine Corps, uh, had been, he'd been one of the presidential security guys. Um, that's cool. He was, when I was talking to him at one point, he was like, yeah, you know, I'm getting out of it. I'm, I'm leaving presidential security. I'm thinking about trying to go to a recon or Anglico. And I was like, what, what's Anglico? He's like, oh, they're kind of like recon, except they like, they like jump in and call for fire. Um, it's like, oh, that sounds really cool. So, anyways, I'm sitting with the monitor. He's got this this thing listed for Anglico. I kind of don't know what that is. So it sounds kind of interesting. Um, I don't remember what the monitor said to me, but he's like, yeah, go check it out. So I, I went. Uh, the Anglico CP wasn't too far from where two eight was, so I walked over uh, and sat down with the XO. Uh, this was Major O'Neill at the time. And he just kind of walked me through, like, hey, this is what Anglico is. Like, we're here's what a, the Anglico company structure looks like. We have, you know, two brigade platoons that are supposed to attach to a brigade, two salts, so on down the line. He said, hey, if you come over here, uh, you're going to be a firepower control team leader. And we're going to send you to TACP school now because now they let ground guys go through and you're going to become this thing called a JTAC. It's like, wow, that sounds awesome. Yeah. Uh, me up, man. Yeah, right. And I was like, that sounds amazing. Like, you know, because I'd also been looking at recon and trying to train up for the the uh, recon screening. I was like, all right, I mean, a recon platoon commander probably going to be in the rock a lot, or Anglico team leader probably out with the team a lot. You know, actually on operations in the field. So mm -hmm. started leaning that way, and that kicked off a whole bunch of back and forth. Like, I called the monitor, like, hey, I I, I want to go to Anglico. That, I'm sold. He's like, yeah, I don't have any seats for Anglico, so pick something else. Shit. Uh, I was like, all right, how about Fast Company? I'll, I'll, you know, Fast Company's deployable. They do some cool stuff. He's like, yeah, no billets for Fast either. So they had, uh, at the time, Fast platoons had two officers. Each platoon had a platoon commander and an assistant platoon commander. And that was the year they decided to cut the assistant platoon commander billet. So all of a sudden, their, their openings at Fast Company got cut in half. Um, so that wasn't on the table anymore. And it just turned into a lot of back and forth. Uh, we got on deployment and the list, you know, the, the monitor updated the list. I looked at it again and Anglic was back on there. So Went I finally, it. It, yeah, I finally engaged the battalion. So it was like, Hey, sir, monitor keeps telling me this isn't available. It's on his list. This is what I want. Um, and so the XO who I honestly didn't like, and I don't think much of anybody the battalion liked, uh, but the one good thing he went, called the monitor and got me the orders to Anglico. Um, so, you know, a, a week or so later, I saw the orders show up in the system. You know, I was on the outbound roster with the, the code for Anglico next to it. Um, did you know about, had you heard of any other infantry officers that had been to Anglico before that? I had not. No, I didn't even know it was an option for infantry officers leading up to that. Um, I'd heard of artillery guys going there, but never infantrymen. Mm -hmm. Um, 
Yeah, probably about two hours after it showed up on the outbound roster, my company commander's like, you're not allowed to look at that anymore. I don't want to hear about it. I'm happy for you. Shut up. Do your job. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, uh, so that's, that's kind of get a little bit ahead, but that's kind of the story of how I ended up getting orders there. Uh, rumor has, so that the CEO of Anglico at the time was an infantry officer, uh, Colonel Campbell. Okay. And rumor has, he was trying to angle to get more infantrymen there. Um, yeah, for sure. It's a good experience for everybody. Yeah. Cause there's a lot, but, there's too many infantry officers that don't understand fires enough and there's too many people at Anglico that don't understand any kind of infantry skills, you know? Yeah. But we're going to real quick. So, so for the Mew, uh, we got underway. You know, we did the, the normal PTP stuff, uh, did our Certex, you know, cause we were, this was back when it was still a Mew SOC, uh, special operations capable. So we had a Certex in February and then we got underway in March. Um, not the most exciting deployment. We did, we hit, you know, Palma de Mallorca, like, two weeks after getting underway, but we hit them in the off season. So it was pretty dead there, but, uh, left there, did a week in Israel on an exercise, which is pretty interesting. Um, I didn't get to interact with the Israelis much, but we actually, we went, we started off at a camp way in Northern Israel, uh, for the first part of the exercise. And then we had to convoy all the way to Southern Israel, uh, to do the next part of the exercise. So we did about an eight, 10 hour convoy. Hmm. And the company gunning and I about an hour into it, like the the gunners and the, the two high or the uh, gun trucks were complaining about their feet hurting. So the company gunning and I were both like, "All right, good, get out of the turret." And he and I both climbed up in the turret, rode in the turret for the next like six, eight hours, whatever it was. Oh yeah, man, I would have been too, just like enjoying. Yeah. I mean, when are you ever going to get that opportunity to cruise through oh, Israel yeah. again? You know? Yeah, it was gorgeous. Like, I mean, it's it's such a beautiful country, um, especially like up north and through the. Uh, the main parts. I mean, when you get to the Southern desert, it's, it, it's desert, uh, you know, Middle Eastern desert, but, uh, the rest of it's pretty gorgeous. Yeah. Um, Those are the things certain. I always heard about from the East coast muse, you know, going to all these yeah. cool places. That's why when they, I got orders to first Anglico and they're like, Hey, but you're going on a mule like right after you get there. I'm like, well, maybe it won't be that bad. It sounds, you know, I've always heard good stories and yeah. stuff, you know, but yeah, I'd always heard about the med flows, but like, so we hit Palma, like in the off season. Uh, so it was pretty dead. Um, and then that was our only med port until we got, you know, we, we didn't get any liberty in Israel whatsoever. It was all field. Oh, that sucks. Yeah. Um, and then we pushed through the ditch down the, down the Suez into Setcom. And this was, so Marine Corps always had kind of a back and forth of, uh, with the muse of, wanting to keep the muse in reserve is like in a float, you know, force into readiness. Mm -hmm. Uh, and then there's always taskings that come up for muse that suck them into Iraq, mm -hmm. Afghanistan, Syria, wherever. Yeah. The Marine Corps is like never, they never seem to be a fan of actually putting muse ashore in places like that. Cause they get, they basically get taken away from Marine Corps control and they, you know, work for whoever doing this mission on land. That isn't really what the Marine Corps intends muse to do. Mm hmm. So, you know, if you're familiar with the history, you know, when the invasion happened, you had 22nd Mew and 26th Mew that both went into Iraq for the invasion. Then you had 24th Mew, which Adam Glick was on, that went, they didn't even finish their certification. They flew into Iraq and spent their entire deployment there. Yeah. And then we're the, we're the next Mew on deck. So the Marine Corps, the pendulum swung all the way back to the Marine Corps and said, you're not going in. We're keeping you on ship afloat as a reserve. Um, we got to go into Kuwait for a month for some sustainment training. And then uh, this is actually comical. So the, the Mew was fighting to get a mission in Iraq um, for all the various reasons that senior commanders want missions in Iraq. Um, they'd come up with this idea to put a, a, like a company-sized force ashore in like southern Iraq working under, I think it was an Australian or British task force. And they were like, we're going to, so the Marine Corps was talking about sea basing at the time. Like, we're going to test sea basing. We're going to put these guys ashore, and we're going to supply them all from ship. Um, and they, they couldn't get approval to actually do this mission. I think CENTCOM was shooting it down. Um, and so the commandant flies out. Uh, and this was General Hagee, was the commandant at the time. And uh, 
he comes around and he sits in a wardroom and does a brief with all the officers. Uh, and then he gives him this brief on all the things we've done on deployment and PTP and everything else. And, mm-hmm. uh, it's this total you know, uh, dog and pony show. Yeah. Uh, and he's just tearing the Mew 3 apart throughout it. Oh, um, really? Oh, man. Yeah. Straight from the combat? Which, which, on the one hand, was a little funny because you know, all the company great officers like, were a little sick of the Mew at this point. So we're kind of yeah. enjoying the Mew getting some comeuppance. On the other hand, the Mew S3 was like one of the best field grade officers that was on that float. Mm. So it kind of sucked to watch him be the guy that got it in the face. Yeah. Because uh, he really was a good guy. And, and But uh, yeah, like he, he put up this brief about our sustainment training in Kuwait, which was nothing special. Like we, we went ashore at Kuwait Naval Base. We drove up to Beering. We did a month of training. And then we drove back the other way and we got back on, on the LCAX and went back up to the ships. Yeah. But he threw out a bunch of big, you know, three or four syllable words, you know, synergy was in there somewhere uh, when he was talking about all this. And uh, the commandant at the end of that slide was like, I understand all of the words you just said. I have no idea. Or he said, I'll, I understand all the words you just used. I have no idea what you just said. <laughs> Oof. That's tough. Uh, and then they briefed the, the whole thing they were trying to do in Iraq. And he got up at the end. He's like, hey, guys, look. You know, I was just down the mess deck talking to the Marines. They're all asking about going to Iraq. I get it. Uh, you know, I would like to go to Iraq too, but I'm not going to Iraq and neither are you. And it's just like you feel the air go out of the room uh, when they said that. So you're just going to uh, sit on ship and rot. Yeah. Um, then, of course, he says that. And then a week later, apparently, CENTCOM changed their minds and they gave us the execute order to do this thing in southern Iraq. There you go. So we ended up putting because uh, we didn't we didn't take a we were the first East Coast Mew to not deploy the boat company, we we had a motorized company so we got a bunch of extra Humvees we had the uh, add-on armor kits, and uh, so we had one company that was completely motorized in Humvees, and those dudes uh, went ashore in Iraq along with uh, I think Cat and LAR and then the recon platoon, and they basically were hunting smugglers in southern Iraq, trying to close down these rat lines uh, for about a month or so. That sounds like a good time. Yeah, a lot of driving in the desert, a lot of busting tires. Um, so, it's so much better than being on ship, though. Yeah. You know, that's the alternative. It's like, you want to go drive around through the desert for a month, or you want to sit in prison for a month? Yeah. You know? Well, I was one of the crew that stayed back on ship, so um, yeah. <laughs> I got to suffer. I got to help coordinate, like, you know, their tire resupplies, getting into them. Yeah, uh, yeah. So we did that, and then we left. I know we had a port in Dubai. That was a good time. Dubai yeah. was probably the best port call. Really? We had, uh, yeah, we had a good time. So we had an officer's call in Dubai, uh, the, the entire Mew, and one of the pilots from the Ace had been the guy charged with setting it up, uh, and his call sign was Hot Tub. Uh, really good dude. He's a huge pilot. Um, so we it's it's in a bar in one of the hotels, you know, because it's about the only place you could do something like that. Um, yeah. So we're not, uh, or not a bar, but like a, one of the big uh, dining areas in a, in a hotel. So we're all in there. You've got most of the officers from the, the LHD in there. And these two just drop-dead gorgeous women walk in. Um, they go to another table. Of course, we're all looking at each other like, okay, that's weird. What's going on here? And then a couple more walk in. Like, all right, this is, this is starting to get really weird. Um, you know, I hate to... You know, guys are starting to wonder, like, hey, did Hot Tub get some, like, entertainment for tonight? What's going on? And they just keep coming in. Like, onesies and twosies, more of these women keep walking in. And after a while, like, guys start cheering the next time a group walks in. And then they start chanting Hot Tub uh, as another group walks in. So these poor women are walking in, you know, a bunch of guys chanting Hot Tub at them, not understanding that they're cheering for the guy named, you know, whose call sign is Hot Tub. Uh, it turns out it was a Emirates Airlines uh, class of flight attendants that had just finished their <laughs> training course, and they were all coming out to celebrate. Perfect at the same hotel. Yeah. Um, oh my god, that's like movie stuff. And then I learned the downfall that night of being on a Mew, where you have all your standard Liberty policies because you uh-huh. had to sign up, had to sign up with Liberty buddies, and you had to you know, go back to ship when they did. And my two Liberty buddies were married. At the oh, time. Bummer. So like 20, 2200, they're like, yeah, we're ready to get some sleep. We're, we're punching out. Like 
dragging me along with him. I'd be like, no, dude, no. Staying out. Long. Yeah. You don't go back till curfew. Yeah. If you're not racing so, the clock to get back to ship, then you, I don't know if you did the port call right. Yeah, that well, was a little bit of a bummer. We, we ended up having a lot of good times at some of the bars out in Dubai. Um, yeah. It's obviously expensive there, but... Dubai was like probably my least favorite to be on. Well, not my least. I'd say going to Oman was probably my least. It was like a sand pit pier, yeah. if you want to call it that. Um, Dubai, though, was kind of a letdown. I went to, what was it, Ferrari Land or Ferrari World there. They had the world's fastest roller coaster. World, excuse me, world's fastest roller coaster. Uh, I went and rode that, but it was just kind of like, that was cool. But the rest of the park was kind of garbage. It was it was kind of a letdown, but I didn't do a lot of people went to the hotel resorts and stuff like that and got rooms and we didn't yeah. really do that. We were trying to like, just kind of, I don't know. To me, it was like, if you don't like going to the mall, cause everything is in a mall, there's always like a mall with like a ski, a ski hill on it, a mall with yeah. a wave pool in it, a mall with an aquarium in it. It was always something like that. So I kind of got, kind of got over Dubai pretty quick. I don't know. Yeah. I mean, we had, uh, I remember hitting a water park and just like floating around the lazy river for several hours. Um, it's better than the ship. Yes, absolutely. Obviously. It's worth, worth being off ship. Yeah. Um, okay. We left Dubai and then we, we went into Jordan for an exercise. So this is a good story. Um, we, you know, the BLT pushes way up in you know, a couple hours North, uh, from, we, we pulled an Akaba, which I'm sure you're familiar with. Mm-hmm. Oh, well, um, I've never been there, but I know what you're talking about. So most MUs these days stop at there's a there's a military base. Most MUs these days pull up there. We pulled into the commercial port in Aqaba, mm-hmm. so right next to the city. Um, and then we they bust you know all the BLT uh, you know a couple hours north to go do some training with a Jordanian unit up there, a place called uh, Kayara. And uh, so we went out, you know, hit the field, started doing grunt things. Um, I had the the uh, security platoon for H and S company, so grabbed those guys and went out and started doing a bunch of ranges. And uh, I come back to the battalion CP, and they're like, "Hey, uh, MU commander's here. You need to get on a 46 with him and go back to the ship." Um, sounds like they shot some RPGs or something at the ship. You need to go back to uh, to help plan the backload. Like, okay, Roger. So I grab my stuff, hop on a hop on a 46 for a two hour flight back to the ship, which was terrible. Um, I couldn't find my ear pro, and oh. they didn't have any on hand. So yeah, I spent two hours in the back of a frog with no ear pro, Going and uh, I could I, yeah, I literally was talking to another lieutenant face to face back on ship and couldn't understand a thing he was saying. Um, but get back and find out the story. So this guy, you know, the ships were pulled up in Aqaba at the commercial port. Um, this guy had set up a couple 107s, uh, 107 millimeter rockets in a warehouse in uh, Aqaba. You know, put them on a timer, the usual thing, to shoot at the ships. Uh, so he launched these three rockets. I think one of them failed to go. One of them actually like glanced, like I think it glanced off of something inside the warehouse and like ricocheted out and went into Israel and actually killed like a cab driver in Israel. Oh geez. Because if you've never been to Aqaba, like a lot Israel was like right there across the the bay from you you can see it and hear the music from the, the nightclubs in israel uh from the pier um but one rocket made it it went right over the bow of the ashland and hit a warehouse right next to the cure sarge which was the lhd uh that i was on um and so we had marines from my security platoon that had to stay back on the ship were down on the pier when this happened they were pulling you know they were on the posts on pier mm-hmm. uh guarding the pier and they had a sailor, you know, it was joint blue-green post, so it was one Marine, one sailor at each post. Uh, and then they also had Jordanians, uh, Jordanian soldiers stationed around. So the rocket hits the warehouse, kills a Jordanian uh, that was in the turret of a Humvee next to where it hit. Um, and then these joint blue-green posts suddenly became green posts, like that. Uh, all the sailors, like, took off running uh-huh. for the brow, just completely oh, really? abandoned their post. <laughs> And took off running. Fucking scumbags. And then and then the ship pulls the brow and gets underway. Oh, really? And leaves the Marines on the pier. Oh, well, just let them fight it out if something's about to happen. Yeah, yeah that's nice. So I had like seven or eight Marines uh, from H&S that were left on the pier. 
with only what they had on them when they went down there to stand post that morning. Yeah. Um, and they got left for a week. Oh, whoa, no way. Yeah. That was a mess. So the only thing, so our, our NBC officer, who was on ship at the time, like when he got wind that they were about to pull out, like he ran down to the pier uh, and got down there before the ship got out. And then so uh, Tom Vasquez was our NBC officer, and, and Tom's just a, a very personable guy. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so he started wheeling and dealing. Uh, like State Department folks came by, and he started wheeling and dealing with them. And he got the Marines, you know, a bunch of toiletries and, you know, got a pizzas delivered and a bunch of other stuff to, to take some of the, the sting out of just getting left there. But yeah, then that's they, pretty messed up. Uh, <laughs> but, you, yeah, so I get back on ship. Hold on, did the Seaburn, you're saying the Seaburn officer ran and got off the ship before it pulled away? Yeah. Nice. Good, solid yeah. move. Oh, yeah, Tom was a great guy. Of course, uh, a Seaburn warrant officer would get off the ship as it's trying to pull off. Be like, no, just leave. I'll stay here. Yeah, yeah, Tom. Tom was a fantastic guy. Um, <laughs> great NBC officer, I guess. Seaburn, no, but yeah, uh, he, yeah, yeah. So that was, yeah, that was a mess. And then, you know, I remember getting back on my company gunny's lap because the Navy's having like combat stress, combat operational stress counseling, and, and all that oh, for their sailors. Uh, it's like then, you don't want to make fun of that kind of stuff, but at the same time, it's like, come on, man, like, come on, yeah, you're in the Navy, sack up a little bit. Yeah, most of you weren't even anywhere near this thing. Yeah. Um, and, and then the whole, like, all of ship's company got a combat action group. Of course. Uh, yeah, and, and the Marines who stayed on the pier, like the seven or eight guys that st- stayed at their posts, got nothing. No way, uh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we, we tried to go to bat for it, and they ended up getting nothing. They got some pizzas and stuff. So that's so, different. Yeah. That's A lot of people do, probably don't realize that if a ship gets shot at, all the sailors on the ship automatically get a combat action. Rip. It doesn't matter what yeah, they yeah. were doing. or They could have been asleep in the rack, didn't even know what happened, and they still get one, And which is completely yeah. different than you know the Marine Corps where you get – some people get it. Some people get it for like legitimate reasons, and other dudes still kind of try to talk shit about it. Like, he wasn't shot at that close, you know? Like, yeah, right. You know? I don't know. It's different though, for sure, in the Marine Corps. Yeah, I mean, I get it. It's, a, it's their rule. It's the Navy rules. It's just how it is. Does uh, it get, yeah. did, now, when they all got it, the Marines that were on the ship didn't get it, right? I don't think so. Um, to be honest, I don't know. You're talking about the guys who were actually combat cargo and such that were. I bet they did because they were combat cargo. Because if they followed under the Navy command, which would be a weird way, like try to explain that. You know, if someone asked how you got your combat action ribbon. I don't think they did because um, they were, they weren't actually attached to the ship. No, the mm. the combat cargo officer who's actually assigned to the ship, that's his duty station. Yeah, maybe he did. I don't know. Yeah, I'd have to ask him if I ever heard from him again. Combat but, cargo. God, those guys used to get work, work to yeah, death. So that was I had the collateral duty of being the team embarkation officer. <laughs> um, so every unit's got their embarkation officer that's responsible for all that unit stuff. But every ship also has a team embarkation officer that's responsible for all the stuff on that ship. Mm-hmm. Um, and so I got stuck with that for the LHD. Uh, so I worked with combat cargo a lot. Um, and yeah, those dudes, they, they worked hard. Yeah. Uh, they get the, the CCO, the combat cargo officer, he was just, just irate chief warrant officer. Nobody else could work with him on the ship besides me, uh, or at least out of the like the the Mew Embark officer got along with him pretty well because they knew each other, but like most of the BLT hated him because he was just he's the kind of guy that like if you go talk to him, you ask him for something, he'd rant for like five minutes. Yeah, right. and then we got done with the rant, he'd give you what you asked for, but you'd have to listen to that for five minutes. And I was one of the few guys who would just sit there and, and listen, mm-hmm. and they're like, "Okay, man, can I get what I asked for?" And you're like, "Yeah, cool." Yeah, yeah, let's so, go do that. Yeah, but a lot of other guys couldn't deal with him, so. Uh, Combat cargo. But he he did fight hard for those uh, the Marines on combat cargo that were you know that, I mean they're all you know like they're Marines from the Mew that just get assigned to combat cargo for that sucks. the duration of deployment yeah they don't they don't actually belong to the ship but they get forgotten about by their unit because they're sent away to do combat cargo and at the same time they don't really get taken care of by the ship because they're not actually assigned to the ship uh, but he was pretty good about actually trying to fight take care of those dudes. And then my, my staff and CEO that worked for me as the team embark assistant got kind of screwed by the battalion 
Mm-hmm. Uh, and he he went to bat to try to fight for that guy too. Like he, the battalion didn't want to give him an award because he was a he was an O three sixty nine an infantry staff and CEO who had been relieved as a platoon sergeant. Um, you know because he wasn't very good as a as an infantry staff sergeant, but he like crushed it as a team embarkation assistant. Like he busted his ass uh, down there in the well deck or in the uh, the Visto engine and. Uh, so I tried to recognize him for it, and uh, I got shot down at the battalion awards board because they were like, "Yeah, he's he's not a he's not doing his job as an entry staff and CEO." Like, yeah, but he did really great at this one job, and he should be recognized for it. Mm-hmm. Uh, and they just weren't having it. So I know that uh, the CCO is going to go to bat for him as well. Um, so anyway, yeah, the the whole Akaba thing happened. A lot of bad blood. What year Between, was that? Because I never even heard of that. I never even. Two thousand five. Oh, okay. um, probably like August, July, or August two thousand five. A lot of bad blood uh, between the Navy and the Marines after that. Like I remember our gunner. Every time we did a straight transit, you know, the the Navy's outmanned all the cruiser weapons, and our gunner like made it his mission to go around taking pictures of all the the sailors that were like sleeping on post and you know doing whatever, not wearing their. PPE on post, et cetera. Um, he actually had the, he had the video from, you know, cause the ship's got cameras looking at the pier when this happened. He had the copy of the video of all the sailors running away after the rocket hit. Um, that sucks so, for the good sailors, you know, cause there's good ones out there. Yeah. And it's like, shit like that gives them a bad name. Um, wrap that up. We left Jordan back up through the ditch. We got one port call in, in Rhodes, Greece. Um, I might have done a poor job of monitoring my alcohol intake on the first night. So that became my only night. Oh, in Rhodes. really? Oh, yeah. that's a bummer. Yep. Well, you, had, uh, Cause you couldn't go back out cause you drank too much or because you got in trouble yeah. the first night. <laughs> well, we had set the rule like, Hey, if you don't make it back onto the ship under your own power, uh, you're done. Mm. I know that was a rule in H and S company. And then here I am as the XO, and I didn't make it back under my own powers. Like, well, nobody actually ever told me I was secured, but I was like, well, I, I guarantee the Marines know. Yeah, uh, yeah. So if they see me walking back down the brow, like, that's not the right example to set. So, um, it happens to the best of us, you know. A lot of the, yeah. a lot of dudes don't make it through the first night when they get off ship after after being on for a little bit. Yeah. This is the really terrible thing about that one. We had we weren't allowed to have overnight liberty through the entire deployment until that mm. port call. Yeah. And I had put in an overnight chip. We had a hotel room reserved for the next night, like everything set up. And uh, so I didn't get to go on the, the overnight liberty out of the hotel. Overnight's the way to go. There's It is not fun to come back to the ship. And especially yeah. if it's a, a port call where the ship can't pull up to the pier. You have the little uh, Liberty boats that come out to it, like in Hong Kong. I don't know if you've ever been out there, but like they park out in the bay and you got to take these boats that are just rocking you know, a couple feet. Yeah. So you see people trying to drag people back that are super hammered that are on these boats. It's just, it's a whole, a whole thing's a mess. It's fun to watch though. Yeah, I don't, I've never done a port call where we had to use that. We always were able to go pier side. Oh, really? Even though, yeah. I've, even though I've done, I've been on a big deck every deployment. Um, mm. Yeah, I mean, as a company commander, I hated, like, I honestly got to the point where I hated port calls because of the stress of everybody coming back. Yeah. Because I'd have to be back, you know, an hour beforehand. Uh, you know, all the company commanders, we'd go hang out together and we'd come back an hour beforehand and we'd go stand by the quarter deck and see if anybody, everybody made it back okay. Uh, there was just so much stress. Like, my, you know, and my, my lads did great. Like, we had very, very few incidents. Matter of fact, we were, like, the only unit in the MU on our first port call to go clean with zero incidents. Nice. Uh, like only company in the BLT and then the CLB and the ACE all had problems, but we had nothing. Um, but it was just the constant stress every port call. Like crap, you know, standing down there with my first sergeant and the other company commanders at the, the quarter deck waiting to see, like, is everybody going to make it back? It's like after a while, we were, the company commanders were talking, like, we just don't want to go to port anymore. Let's just stay at sea. <laughs> like, yeah, I imagine it's stressful. Booty, be the platoon yeah. commander, you know. Um, but yeah, I mean, those are kind of all the, the exciting stories off of that one. Um, standard standard mute deployment. So you so you yeah. knew before the deployment you were going to Anglico. 
Uh, so I think we found out on deployment that I actually got orders. Like I'd been trying to get orders there. So, so we deployed in March. I've been trying since like October, November, maybe even earlier. Because I remember talking to one of our facts when we went to AP Hill about it. Like, hey, I'm gonna, there's this JTAC thing I'm going to get to go do. It'll be really cool. Uh, and we went to AP Hill in like September, October. Yeah. So. Did you link up so, with your angle code attachment that was on the ship? We didn't have one. Oh, uh, really? the, East okay. Coast, the East Coast stopped doing new detachments. Uh, Johnny McNamara was the last one, I think. And he was on the 22nd Mew that went into Afghanistan in 2004. So we didn't have one. Um, and being H&S, like I didn't get to do anything with fires the whole time. Um, so we get back. Um, I spent some time helping with the turnover because my company commander changed over. So helping kind of smooth that over, make sure that went smoothly. Uh, and I didn't actually, I had orders to report to Anglico in November. And for some reason I waited all the way until almost Thanksgiving to check in. Um, and I remember like talking to one of my old, old buddies from that tour. He's like, I remember your, like when you did your welcome aboard, he's like, you know, they had all the officers in, at the uh, Oak club at Camp Lejeune. He's like, I remember you, I don't remember it, but he remembers it. Like, I remember you getting up and like, Hey, great to be here. Um, I haven't really done fires since IOC, but I'm really looking forward to learning. Uh, he's like, man, you could hear like the record screech when you said that. Like everybody just stopped because at this point, Anglico had just come back from Iraq and they were doing about seven on five off. Like they were just constant back to back Iraq tours. Mm -hmm. So all these dudes had just gotten back off an Iraq tour as JTACs uh, and they're turning around and going right back out the door in a few months. And here's this guy comes in like, hey, never done fires uh, since I have We can't wait to learn. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, so I got there. I, I mean, I was one of so the the, the commanding officer, Colonel uh, Campbell, was an infantry officer, and then there were three others, uh, myself included. So we had a total of four infantry officers at the time when I checked in, um, which was cool to be one of the the few guys there. And it was all very JTAC centric when I got on board. Um, there were, we really didn't do a lot of surface fires. There was no naval gunfire. Mm -hmm. uh, it was all focused on creating as many JTACs as we could. Their 2005 deployment had been very, like they had basically flattened the structure to make as many, uh, visible, okay. uh and it pushed everybody who could control out with a team. Oh, say that, say that, I, I, cut for just a second you said you flatten the structure and then what else okay so they flatten the structure to make as many firepower control teams as possible okay. essentially anybody who could control was pushed out on that deployment so i mean they had brigade platoon commanders getting controls uh i think the the company xo got some controls like live drops in combat crazy uh, matter of fact i think the company xo got like a bronze star oh really that wow uh the company the the commanding officer might have even had some drops. I couldn't say for sure. but That would be pretty wild. Like, they trained up everybody. The the, the freaking comm chief had been in recon mm -hmm. at one point as a communicator, but had been through BRC. So they got uh, they got approval to send him to TACP. So the comm chief was a JTAC. That's crazy wow. that they're sending all those people. But, I mean, for people that don't realize, that was a – there was a lot going on at the time. And oh, yeah. that was like, uh, that's like an era of Anglico that the guys nowadays, like when I was there and stuff would look back on because those dudes were going out and attaching to ODAs and attaching to SEAL teams and attaching, you know, doing like some pretty badass stuff. Yeah. Well, I mean, if, so like if you, I mean, I think if you look at Anglico on Wikipedia, right, there's a picture of a second Anglico team on top of a rooftop controlling air for, uh, in al I think it was, for Steel Curtain. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's, it's you can tell it's an older picture, like the JTAC, the team leader's on a handset, an H250 handset, uh, and one of his guys has an M16 with an M203 and an EOTech on top of the carrying handle on the M16, right? <laughs> um, so that was actually a brigade platoon commander, that guy that was on the, the handset. Oh, really? Uh, so that gives you an idea of like how how much they flattened it and pushed guys out as much as possible. Yeah. Um, so I show up into that environment uh, where they're basically like, hey, everybody 
train everybody as a JTAC uh, and push out as many teams as possible. Um, and because I showed up when I did, uh, close to Thanksgiving, I actually missed going to – so so back then, you're familiar with TACP Primer mm-hmm. that you ran at uh, 11th Marines. 10th Marines. Um, yeah. 10th Marines, sorry. Um, back then, JTAC Primer was actually a resident school at EWTG Land. Oh, a, okay. It was a one-week course you had to go to at uh, EWTG Land, and it was basically like week one of TACP school. Mm-hmm. So – how to call for fire, the capabilities of fire support assets, capabilities of aircraft, et cetera. Uh, and you did a couple of sim, you did a couple of sims, call for fire sims and a couple of uh, close air support sims. That was about it. Mm-hmm. Um, but I missed the November class date because I checked in late. Um, and so I had to cycle to, I think it was end of February, which meant that I was going to, the company was deploying in mid February and I was still waiting to go to JTAC primer. Um, so I did that. Um, you know, I spent a couple, you know, I got on board and we started doing some training up immediately. Um, you know, I did the normal thing like you're familiar with at Anglico or like squadrons call up like, Hey, we're going to do X. We're going to do some convoy escort. You know, mm-hmm. you guys want to come out and work with us. So like my first couple of weeks there, I linked up with a couple of the, the JTACs who were older guys that were on their way out uh, to start training me up. And they one night they had some Cobras that were the work convoy escort. So we loaded into one of these guys, uh, little like Hyundai two door uh, cars with a, a 117 between my feet, uh, and we drove around doing uh, you know anti ISR and a couple of like six lines as we drove around the base and we literally just drove around the base around Camp Lejeune. Just doing route scans. Uh, yeah, with a Nizzle and a 117. Like it's crazy to think of now, knowing as much as I know about laser safety, that I literally just had Nizzle, and we like <laughs> stopped at one point. We literally stopped. It, it, there's a range on Camp Lejeune called Golf Six. It's a you know a range that most infantrymen are familiar with. Like. We just stopped, pulled off on the, like, the side of Golf 6, and I like hopped out and sparkled the target with a missile. <laughs> no, no LRSO, no laser range safety officer, no anything. Didn't call in the Blackbird. Just hop off, sparkle the target, run a six line. No idea what I was doing either because I hadn't been to any training. Yeah. Um, That's funny. And I was basically like, Don't, hey, save this now. Like, uh, you know, and this was back when it was still six lines instead of five lines. But, um, so, you know, go on Christmas break, we come back, they did a, a deployment for training out to Arizona to do more JTAC sustainment. Um, you know, we went to Gila Bend and, and uh, Yuma. Yeah, good time. We spent a week in Gila Bend. It was really funny because if you know anything about Colonel Campbell, he's an interesting guy. Like the, I went to the confirmation brief for it and they're, they're going through everything and they're like, hey, we're going to, we're going to be at Gila Bend on these days. We're going to be on this OP. These are the JTACs. This is the air that we have on station, blah, blah, blah. You know, the standard things. And Colonel Campbell's like, that's great. What's the plan for Libo? Uh-huh. Well, so after we leave Gila Bend, we're going up to meet with these guys in Tempe. And then we're going to get hotels in Scottsdale. And we're going to spend the weekend in Tempe, Arizona, around Arizona State University. <laughs> uh, oh, it's convenient. I didn't realize it was there. Oh. Yeah, well, how do you, and I mean, we were going to Yuma the next week. So if you know the geography of Arizona, Gila Bend, Phoenix, Yuma. Yeah. So we went, you know, Gila Bend, Phoenix, then Yuma. Um, completely out of our way to go spend the weekend in Phoenix, uh, in Tempe and such. But um, so we go out, we do that. We spend a week in Gila Bend, which was a good time working with uh, Air Force, learning. You know, first time seeing A-10s in action. Uh, and learning that those guys are weird. Um, People don't know until they work with them that they're like assholes. Like they, it's real hit and miss. They can be really great or really hard to work with. Well, I mean, the JCast pub was fairly new at that point. They did. Uh, like I remember, a buddy of mine was was working a section of A tens, and they they said, "Hey, we we want to do. Uh, we want to. We've got some white phosphorus rockets. We want to throw a mark out there for ourselves, and you adjust us off the." WP rockets, like, all right, cool, we'll give that a shot. So, so Blues control them, and they they roll in and they call up, and he's like, up. He looks around at the rest of us. Everybody just kind of shrugs their shoulders. Like nobody knows what an up call is. Yeah. Like, continue. I mean, if you don't know what else to say, say continue. 
and they uh, they wave off and they get all pissy on the radio like, hey, you were supposed to give us clearance. And he's like, that's not a thing, guys. Like, yeah, there's no such thing as clearing you after an up call. So uh, they went back through the whole drill. They lofted their WP rockets and you know, it all worked out. But uh, kind of the, the intro to the A-10s in their own uh, unique way of doing things. It's always good to have um, somebody out there that's been out there before to kind of explain yeah. how it's going to work because people that don't know will get it. I've seen guys try to get into little like almost pissing matches on the radio about the the doctrine or how it, how the control flow is supposed to happen. And it's just like, dude, look, they're not they're doing it their way and it's correct by their standards and we do it our way and it's correct by our standards you're just going to have to flex a little. You're not going to get read back from dash too. It's just one of those things, you know, yeah. but some of them, some of them are cool though. Some, we had a female, a 10 pilot who was sitting at like 14 to 16, something like that. 14,000 feet to 16,000 feet. And, um, same deal. They're going to throw out type one bomb on coordinate, single, single WP rocket, white phosphorus rocket as a mark. And then correct for the uh, rockets and guns or the gun attack after. And she shot that thing from like 14,000 feet. You know, this is an unguided rocket and just shacked the target. And I'm like, Oh yeah. shit, like sick. You know, like that's your target. And she's like, no, I need a correction. And we're like, no, seriously, you just like, you hit the target, like hit your mark. Cause that was a great shot. <laughs> you know, I was just like one of those things where you're like, that's why we keep them around. Yeah. You know? Actually. So, I mean, later on, fast forward to INID uh, as a major, I worked with the Maryland guard, a 10, squadron quite a bit and those dudes were amazing yeah uh, i never had I mean, a few minor issues with them they like to call in while they were still rolling yeah uh, you know like I, I mean and they would get mad when i wouldn't clear them hot like no man you're not getting a clearance until you roll wings level uh, on your your actual heading mm -hmm. but uh for the most part they were great to work with um the only like that small issue and then they like to like the few times we actually did uh, indirect fire integration with them. Like we went to Quantico and had an artillery battery shooting for them there. And they like to keep asking, confirm gun target line cold. Oh, and, yeah. You know, after the, the last suppression round shot, it's like 30 seconds prior to the TOT. I'm like, dude, if we are really busy right now. I don't have time to. to they're, just, uh, they're just not used to that same kind of integration like the Marines do. Yeah. And that's the after action I had with them. Like, hey, man, you can't do that. Like, we are really busy. I will tell you if there's a late shot and you need to turn around. That's my job. Mm -hmm. uh, and the, the, the pilot that I was talking to was like, yeah, we get it. Like we've done this a couple of times now. And so we understand now, and it's going to be a specific briefing point for us that when we're working with Marines that you guys do this habitually and you, you have the procedures down. And so we're just going to have to kind of trust you. Yeah. They, put, they, they think they've done some stuff with like army and they're like, yeah, we don't trust those guys at all to not shoot <laughs> late. I remember it's weird because the army doesn't, they do, I mean, they do joint fires or integrated fires, but not to the same level and not to the extent. I think every time Marine artillery goes out to the field, you know, even if there's not other sections, we inject that into the scenario just to make someone think about, you know, the controlling of fires. And it's, I think we take it for granted how good we are with it and stuff like that. And I remember being in Kuwait at Camp Buring at, out of OP-10 and we were supposed to come out. There was an army unit that was going to shoot mortars. And then they had some FOs out there that were shooting the ripper rounds out of the HIMARS rockets. Um, my dog's over here making a lot of noise. Sorry about that. <laughs> and uh, yeah. I don't know if you can hear him, like, oh, you know, doing his thing. But um, I remember coming up to the OP, and I told uh, there was an FO up on the up on the OP with the radio. And I'm like, hey, man, we got, uh, we got Apaches coming in in, like, 15 minutes, you know, coming from the west or whatever. And he's like, okay, well, I'll just shut these guys down then, you know, let you do your controls and then we'll pick up afterwards. And I'm like, fuck that. Like, let's do it together, man. And yeah. he's like, okay. He's like, what, can we do that? And I'm like, yeah, why not? So we did see ad with uh, the high Mars and he was just like, dude, we never, he's like, we never do this. He's like, this is, I've never, this is not something I've ever done. I'm like, why shut it down? We can make it all work. You know, uh, yeah. the Apaches weren't too happy. They didn't really like the idea because <laughs> they don't like to stay inside of, in the Marine Corps, how we, for people that don't know, in the Marine Corps, how we route aircraft is we use like blocks of airspace and we'll be like, Hey, fly in this block of airspace and Marine pilots will do it. They'll move to their little block. Sometimes they'll bleed out if they're trying to see something or do something and you got to, you know, correct them. But Apache pilots just want to orbit. 
the entire oh, area. Yeah. They don't want to stay in one spot, which makes it hard. It, it when that becomes the issue, it's like, bro, if you just trust me and I trust that you're going to go where I told you to go, everything works out. But if one of us fucks yeah. it up, one of us breaks the trust, you know, then, then we're in a bad situation. So, yeah. Yeah. I had similar yeah. experience. I mean, I was on a, again, at Fort Dix and we had Cobras coming on station and range control. Like I had briefed them. I briefed range control. Hey, we're doing this TACP shoot. We're going to have mortars hot and I'm going to have Cobras check on station. And I want to keep the mortars hot while the air's on station. And the army range control is like, you can't do that. Like, yes, we can. Let me show you. And so I walked them through how we did deconfliction. I'm like, oh, okay, that makes sense. So like, all right, good to go. So the range control officer is good. We get to day, ex- day of execution, and obviously the guy on the fire desk didn't get the word. Um, so Cobra's check on. He shuts off the mortars, tells him to go to check fire. But not only does he do that, he calls the mortar OIC on the radio, the 81 Splatoon commander, it's like, or on the phone, rather. It's like, hey, listen, you guys are about to check on station. You need to fire all remaining right now. What? Or you're not going to get sh- because this was the last day, the mortars had a bus coming at like 1800 to pick them up and take them back mm-hmm. to uh, Long Island. And so he's like, you need to fire all remaining right now or you're not going to get to shoot at the rest of them. And of course, the fire desk guy had no idea. The Cobra's already on station. They're in the HA. Mm-hmm. And the JTAC had already given them a nine line because the mortars were shut off. So he was like, hey, we're just going to run an attack without the mortars until we get this sorted out. So he passed them a nine line. And so while he's saying this, the, the Cobras are already pushing up to the BP. And then they start pushing from the BP in for rockets and guns towards the target. And then, fortunately, the mortar FO on the hill had a, a, a Motorola that was tuned to the, the gun line's frequency. Mm-hmm. And he heard the fire commands over the Motorola. It was like, hey, they're about to shoot rounds. And so we quickly aborted those Cobras, told them get back to the BP, and then they volleyed all the, their remaining rounds. Uh I mean, you know, that's a big deal. Like, I yeah. blasted that mortar platoon commander. Um, called him up like, you absolutely can never do that again. Uh, that was a 100% of safety of flight issue. But yeah. uh, you have I know, the, the Army and Air Force just aren't used to that. They just don't do it as much as we do. Like, you know, being in the artillery, like, shooting shooting early or shooting late is a big deal. Yeah, oh, uh, 100%. If it's, like, a second late, everyone's like, what the fuck, man? You know, yeah. it's like... We are some of the judgiest people in the Marine Corps, you know, yep. is like um, everything about artillery. If people are like super anal about you say the wrong. I wrote up a thing on Facebook um, as a I, I think I've talked about this on one of the other podcasts, but it just recently came back up on Facebook. Um, a post about the artillery piece that exploded at Fort Bragg. And yep. I wrote up like a kind of my perspective of it made it kind of I don't know. It was a nice little write up, I thought. And I think I put in there that the person on the radio, when the round exploded in the chamber, for those of you who don't know what happened, was a M777 at Fort Bragg. The Marines loaded it. The fuse that was on it was set from the factory. It was a, f- a malfunction from the factory. So instead of spinning so that it would, a certain amount of times and it would set, it was already ready to go. So when they rammed it in, that pressure of it ramming in exploded the round in the chamber. Mm-hmm. And did, luckily no one got killed. Multiple people were injured. Anyway, one of the guys said check firing on the radio, and I think I wrote in the little story that he said check fire, and I had like people harassing me on Facebook, like <laughs> this makes me question that if you're really an artilleryman, you know, if saying check fire instead of check firing, because anyone would know. And I'm like, oh my god, dude! Like I've been out of the Marine Corps <laughs> for a couple of years. I'm sorry, I forgot something. You yeah. know, it's like, but that's the kind of like people that are in artillery. It's a very yeah. like. I'm going to say this and then you're going to say that. And this is how everything's going to work. And that's how the trust works. You know, that's how I trust that as an FO, you're not going to blow me up, you know, on accident. So anyways, yeah. Uh, Good times. Um, Yeah. So we, you know, get back to the DFT out to Arizona and we were still in, in Gila Bend. I got a chance to control. Like my first fixed wing control was like a FAC A integration Hmm. with two sections of F-16s. I remember the company air officer, like I, I got it done. I ran in some attack out there at uh, North Tech, I think. And he's like, yeah, you know, first first control, back A integration. And I was like, I don't honestly know what just happened. Like, it was like, you know, like old school. Like, I, I blacked out. I don't know what, what just happened. Yeah. You know, because I was like, I, I have no idea what I'm doing. I, I'm just going to read some things and see what goes. Um, but, uh, you know, got that all done. Uh, I think I 
I didn't get very many more controls out in Arizona, unfortunately, because they were prioritizing the guys that had just been to JTAC primer mm-hmm. and were waiting to go to TACB school. Yeah. Um, I don't know, like how much you know about the, the pipeline back then, but you had to go to JTAC primer as a resident course. Then you had to go back to your unit and get, I think it was 12 additional controls or maybe 14 oh, wow. in your unit before you could go to TACP school. Wow. That's pretty wild. Yeah, you had to do all this other weird stuff too. Like you had to go attend a, you had to go to a squadron and watch them brief a cast mission. Really? Was yeah. this was this a like second Marine Division specific thing, or was this like a Marine Corps yeah, wide? It was a TNR. So huh. you know, the whole genesis of the JTAC thing. Um, so in 2003, after the invasion, Marine Corps realized like we need more controllers, and the facts are there's just not enough of them. Mm-hmm. Um, and it was, you know, and I don't know exactly where the push and pull. I know that I think the JCAS pub was coming out around that time, the new JCAS pub that, that actually defined what a JTAC is. And it, maybe there was some writing on the wall that it was becoming a thing where you had to be a certified controller of some type to actually drop. Because mm-hmm. in the past, as a lot of the old guys will tell you, you didn't have to be certified anything to control aircraft. Yeah. If there, um, a lot of them don't so, like the fact that there's even like a TCP school or anything. They're like, you should yeah. know that anyway. That's your MOS. Right. Yeah. Um, so it started becoming a thing. So 2003 and Almar came out and said, hey, there's this JTAC program. This is going to be a thing. Marine Corps, we're going to start training to this. And actually, there's a guy, former um, Anglico guy from Desert Storm, uh, Doug Kleinsmith, I think is his name, uh, was, I think, instrumental in that. Um he was actually one of the team leaders. He was one of the thick leaders that was on the berm mm-hmm. at the Battle of Kachi mm-hmm. when that all happened. Okay. Um, so then Omar comes out. They don't sign the TNR manual until 2005, right before I got the Anglico. And that's what specified. The TNR manual is what said you had to go to JTAC Primer and then do all these other things after. But the funny thing was it was only for ground guys. If you were a pilot, you didn't have to do any of that. You just went straight to TACP school, and then you came out fully certified. Which is kind of crazy. I mean, I could see it, I guess, for shooter platforms, you know, your F-18 or Cobras. But, like, your 53 guys don't know anything. You know, your 46 guys don't know anything. Nothing against them. They just don't – you're not in that shooter kind of world. So that was a big – so when I went to JTAC Primer, I already had a couple of live controls. That's pretty cool. JTAC Primer was pretty easy. Um, you know, it was like a week of just TAD up in EWTG land, sit through class for a couple hours, go to Hot Tuna afterwards. Um, you know, I, I went out uh, the Thursday night. You know, we had a test Friday morning at the conclusion of class. I was out drinking till like 2, 3 in the morning the night prior, which is funny because the – so we already knew who our incoming CEO was going to be. For Anglico, and he was in JTAC Primer with me, mm-hmm. sitting next to me uh, in the class when I, I roll in for the test, like still smelling like alcohol. Like I had slept through my alarm, like woke up 15 minutes before the test, and like barely had enough time to shave and get over there um, and roll in, like blow through the test as quickly as I can so I can go grab some Gatorade and some Advil from the PX. Uh, this is not as uncommon of a thing as people would like to you know, I know, right? think. Yeah. I'm sitting here laughing because I'm thinking of one of my buddies that did a similar thing at EWTG Pack, where we went yeah. out and drink and he came in super hung over the next morning. I mean, it was JTAC primer, like I crushed the <laughs> test, but it wasn't like it was a difficult test. Um, and, you know, Colonel Robinson sitting next to me just laughing. Uh, as, I, as I finished the test, like, hey, sure, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tap out and go grab some uh, Gatorade and some, some ibuprofen. Yeah. Um, but uh, we did that, and then, you know, by that point, the company's deployed. Like, they actually left before I went to JTAC Primer, which which sucked to watch your, your unit deploy without you. Yeah. Um, like, I just pinned on captain. Um, but the plan was for you to catch up with them, right? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, because I know she's going to listen to this later, but, you know, I, I wouldn't do it again differently because during that time between JTAC Primer and DCP school was when I met my wife. But, uh <laughs> Um, so in the end, it was all worth it. It well, uh, definitely sucked, sucked to watch those guys get on the bus and head overseas without you. For um, sure. yeah. 
So I go back to the unit, um, and I was getting trained up by a couple of guys that were staying back that had done, already done a deployment or two and were getting out. Um, so they put us through a few more things. They actually lined up. You know, one six was doing a a, a TCP shoot out at Golf Ten. You know, where they were running all their fist teams through, but they they didn't have any facts at the time. They only had their battalion air officer. So they wanted some JTACs to come out and, and you know, go in with the fist team. So uh, myself and actually uh, you interviewed Matthew Moyer a while back. His his future team leader and I, uh, Charlie Lamont, he and I both went out to this TACP shoot attached to one six's fist teams as their JTACs. And got a ton of controls there because um, they had a fair amount of air throughout. And so we just did a bunch. And it's all the standard you know, CAD integration, um, you know, lots of artillery and mortar integration with close air support, but it's on the standard, like nine line cast from the IP using an artillery indirect fire mark. Like the thing that for Marines is kind of bread and butter. Like we do it all, we yeah. constantly talk about it, train to it all the time. It's, it's almost like second nature. But uh, I mean, I've got, I probably, by the time I went to TACP school, I think I had like 60 life controls. Jeez, that's crazy. Yeah. Uh, like I knocked out a ton. Um, so, uh, and then I go back to TACP school. And again, like you said, it's, you know, you go back and, and there were, there were three ground guys in the course. I think it was me and Charlie. And then it was a, uh, there was a chief warrant officer from fourth Anglico who was a SOTAC, you know, special operations, terminal attack control or whatever it stands for. Yeah. Um, he had been with Fourth Anglico, had gone to the SOTAC course, which SOCOM runs, but the Marine Corps doesn't recognize it as a JTAC course. Yeah, <clears throat> still to so this he, day, right? Yeah, and he'd yeah. done a deployment to Iraq as a SOTAC, like supported an ODA uh, with his Anglico team. But here he is at TACP school, and again, we're all treated like uh, kind of second class citizens as the ground dudes in the class. <laughs> um, and I don't, you, you probably know who Mike Grice is, not everybody else does, but Mike Grice is a I know the Pretty name. Well I, he let, he was the CEO at First Anglico before I got there. Yeah, he's a pretty well known well known name in the Anglico community. I think he did a lot of time. I think he was a team leader at the time when I was at second. I think he was the opso for First hmm. Anglico. But he wrote an article in two thousand six um, called you know Marine Corps Jerk Joint Terminal Attack Controller. But the little subtitle was a view from the back of the bus. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> And he was just like blasting the Marine Corps for why are you taking all these, you know, infantry and artillery guys uh, and treat them like second class citizens and making them jump through all these other hoops while you have 53 and frog guys who don't go through any of this. Mm -hmm. uh, and so we didn't touch on, but once you finished TCP school, the ground guy, you weren't designated. Yeah. You had to do, they called it the combat qualified syllabus back then. You had to do an additional like 14 controls yep. back at your unit. And you had to hit certain wickets to become designated, which we're, that's standard now. But back then that, that was only for ground guys. Yeah. For people that don't really know what we're talking about, when you say get designated, that means the CO signs off on a letter, meaning you can go control aircraft without someone supervising you. Like you are a qualified designated JTAC that can go out and drop bombs without supervision and you're good to go. So any, any aviator at that time could go straight to TSP school from the squadron. And then they were designated at the end of TSP school, like go off, do great things, mm -hmm. you know, no supervision required, but all the ground guys had to do this additional stuff. Yeah. So that's why Mike Rice like blasted this uh, Gazette article. And it, it comes out while we're at TSP school. And I think we were in like the second week cause we were in one of the like naval gunfire sims. Uh, there at EWT land, and one of the instructors, like, boom, comes in the door with the article. Is like, where are the Anglico guys? Yeah. And we're like, you know, the three of us are saying, like, they're like, yeah, what do you want? And we go outside, and he's like, have you seen this article? And he starts trying to get up on us. And the funny thing about this is, this guy was actually, he was also a JTAC. Mm -hmm. He was a Dasketeer. Uh, yeah. So, uh, I mean, Direct Air Support Center guy who was on the EWTG Lance staff, but by virtue of being on their staff, he got qualified as a JTAC. Um, but he's trying to rip into us about this article, and eventually they're like, "All right, listen up, bud. Let me break it out for you." Like, you know, Lamont and I here came here with multiple dozens of controls. This guy did a deployment to Iraq. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, 
fraud guy in there while a great dude doesn't know what he's doing. Doesn't know anything about target location. Doesn't know anything yeah, about, exactly. you know, fire support integration. Yeah. But he's going to walk out of here completely he's combat qualified. We have to go through another couple of weeks of training back at our unit mm -hmm. to even be considered good to go. Um, and so he backed off of us once we kind of fought back we're like, hey, listen, bro, this is why he said this in this article. And, and frankly, it is BS. Um, the pendulum swung back the other way. You know, I mean, we still, we were still doing, I know when at 10th Marines, we were doing primers. Anyone that went to TCP school had to do the two week primer, which was basically the courseware. We'd get the courseware, the most up to date courseware from the students that were coming back from TCP school and just update the primer. So we were, constantly teaching what was the most current stuff and then i remember right before i left to go to anglico to execute my orders to anglico we got i think we either got a request or someone hit us up because there was a class of students that went to tcp school and i think there was like three or four 53 pilots in the class and every one of them failed and they yeah. were like they didn't it, because they don't. And it, again, it's not necessarily their fault. They don't have any kind of fire support experience. They don't have any target yeah. location experience. It's they don't even have any kind of like that combat comms kind of experience because they're utility aircraft or moving shit around. They're not like yeah. tipping in and doing rockets and guns and stuff. So it's a different world. And I think, I don't know if they did it or not, but I know there was a call. It was like, Hey, can we send the next class of dudes to your primer before they go up to the schoolhouse? And we were all about it. We're like, yeah, man, we're, we're trying to churn out a better product here. You know, we're trying yeah. to prep these guys. So when they go up there, because in my situation, you know, I, I was only there a year prior going to TCP school myself. I went to the primer, came back, went to TCP school, only got a handful of actual controls. None of them were like actual live bombs. Cause I was on the East coast, you know, they were all just the concrete training bombs. And then got sent to Afghanistan without even finishing a full, like what you call the combat syllabus. I didn't get any of that. It was like, here's a yeah. handful of controls. Now you're on an advisor team. Good luck. Go, go do big things. So the, yeah, it definitely swung back the other way where it almost became, but it was out of necessity at the time. The guys, yeah. there were so few, so few qualified and designated JTACs. And the ones that were, that were, were just boom, 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 deployment, 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 one after another, you know, no rest. And a lot of those dudes, man, good on them. You know, they sacrifice their probably their own mental health, their families, relationships, and stuff like that to do the mission. And, um, you know, that's why I always told guys that were like, man, I wish I could become a JTAC. I'm like, careful what you ask for, man, because you might yeah. get it. Because it's a great job, you know, and I would totally do it again. However, it is a highly stressful job. It is a highly stressful job where you're, it can be a highly stressful job where you're constantly training you're never not training you're always you know you're always learning something there's always something new and uh yeah but yeah yeah we break here real quick for a quick miss break yeah yeah good good all right so uh what's next man what, what was next for you tcp school done you know now you got to go yeah. get these follow-on controls and stuff like what what was after that yeah so we did that we got back i mean yeah, nothing to with TSP. I mean, the second class citizen thing was definitely annoying. Um, yeah. I did get to control some F-14s while I was there, which was oh, cool. Oh, wow. Probably um, one of the last the, times that, 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 got, yeah. that happened. The instructor made me abort them because uh, he said they were out of parameters and they were totally within parameters. Uh, he, he screwed it up. Um, it was a little sad that he made me abort. My only F-14 drop. Ah. Um, they were actually cool. So the... The squadron, it was the squadron commander flying, and he was a former enlisted Marine. And he had a couple of his guys were in our TCP class uh, getting their FAC A cert. Mm -hmm. uh, and so he completely, like, he did a panel check at the end. He completely broke camp yeah. engineering reg regulations. Coming like 50 feet off the ground. Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was, they were like, hey, stand by. This is going to the two uh, NFOs that were in our class. Were like, hey, this is going to be a good one. And then we saw him come over to the top of the impact area, and, and yeah, he blew the doors off the OP. Um, Good times. So we wrapped that up. Um, you know, they do the normal thing, or it's sometimes normal thing, at least on the East Coast, where they, they wrap up like early Thursday. Uh, but they've still got, you know, Thursday night and all day Friday with air, so they gave that back to another unit to mm, use. Cool. So we got to stay out Thursday and Friday and get some more controls. That's cool. Um and then, 
yeah, we, we started wrapping up the rest of our controls, doing some more training with the, the guys that were there. Uh, we'd already done, I think when we were in Arizona, we'd already done a piss off search. So we already knew piss off pretty well. Um, for those who aren't familiar, it's a software that we use for precision targeting. Um, so you can get a, an accurate enough grid to drop a GPS guided ordinance on it. Um, and then, uh, yeah, the funny thing was like we got, uh, the, the guys that we were getting trained up by had done previous deployments, but they're, you know, you learn like everybody's deployments a little bit different. These guys had done deployments where they were totally like Humvee mounted. Yeah. Uh, and so I remember like we were going over gear set up and they're like, Hey, you know, don't worry about the camel back. You don't need it. Like, it's just, a, it's just extra weight. You don't need it. You're going to have the Humvee there. It's going to have a cooler with cold water in it. That's all you need. Uh, and I was like, you know, as an infantryman, I was like, eh, I'm going to take the camel back just in case. Uh, and I paid off later. Um, so we go back, we get a, like a couple of weeks of leave. Like, uh, you know, I found out, uh, found out I was going to go replace, actually, I mentioned the comm chief was a JTAC. He was actually coming back to get ready to retire. And so I was going to take over his team when I got there and he was working for uh, a military transition team for advisors to the Iraqi army. So I'd be working, you know, living, working with the Iraqi army. Um, so my, my girlfriend at the time, we go, you know, visit some friends up in Virginia. I mean, one of whom was a buddy of mine from the reserves. Like we'd been in college together. He joined my, the reserve unit that I was in. Uh, and then when I commissioned, he stayed, finished out his enlisted time in the reserves. Mm -hmm. um, and he had gotten activated in 2005 and done a deployment to Haditha. And as a combat engineer, and he'd actually been attached to that reserve battalion that had a AAV full of guys blown up. Um, so he had some, some interesting experiences over there. And I remember we're out to dinner with them, with him and his, uh, I don't think he and Shelly were married at the time. I think they were still dating. But uh, we're out with him and his girlfriend. Um, and he's like, hey, what are you going to be doing over there? I was like, well, I'm going to be uh, working with this Iraqi army unit. And as soon as he heard Iraqi army, he went, ooh. <laughs> and I didn't really think too much of it. And man, it freaked my girlfriend out. Ah, bad. Uh, she absolutely caught it. And she was like, just beside herself, worried, like, oh, crap. Uh, so that was not good, but you know we uh, get the rest of the week. We spend some time uh, in a cabin in Virginia, have a good time, and then we get back. Uh, and we hop a you know there's like three of us deploying late, so we hop a C-17 to fly over to Iraq and, and catch up with the rest of the company. Um, you know, land in Al Assad. I know Matt mentioned that like his team leader had gotten pulled because they had a SIPCAS incident. Mm -hmm. um, I got there right after that happened, uh, and I knew the team leader. Um, so they were like, Hey, you need to get with this guy and get like his lessons learned on what happened. Um, and so we, we spent some time with him. Um, the interesting thing about it, like kind of one of the, the causative factors was nobody had ever heard of this or really practiced this idea of doing type two through an observer during training. Like this wasn't a concept anybody had talked about the idea that you're going to have, you're going to be in a COC. And you're going to have some other guy that's out there in contact that's telling you where the target is, and you're going to clear an aircraft hot based off of what he tells you. Yeah. Like, hey, the guys that the guy that's getting shot at is like, I'm here, and this direction, this distance, there's some bad guys, and and you're back as a JTAC in the COC, using that to target and deliver ordnance off of. Uh, nobody had ever talked about that before this deployment, um, and that's essentially kind of what went wrong on his. Uh, his control like he wasn't there he was in the coc and he was relying off of a corpsman with one of the mitt teams who was a a reconnaissance corpsman yeah if i remember right uh i could have that wrong but i think he was a sark uh so the, the not a guy who didn't know anything like a, a pretty knowledgeable well-trained guy yeah but they got it they got it wrong and they, they, there was a civilian woman that got injured in that strike so they were like hey go go talk to this team leader and pull pick his brain about everything. And he was very open and honest about it. Um, and, and went through what went wrong. Um, so, and then I push out the Hamania to my salt that was already set up with, uh, so the way it worked in, like, I mean, you're familiar with, with Anglico, 
the company headquarters is designed to attach to a division level unit Mm -hmm. as kind of their fire cell. And then the platoons are supposed to attach to a brigade, salts attached to a battalion, et cetera. With the Iraqi army, we went one level up. So the, the platoons were attached to Iraqi division headquarters or working. They weren't really working for the Iraqis. They were working for the transition teams mm-hmm. that were advising the Iraqis. But So we had a platoon with 1st Iraqi Army Division and a platoon with 7th Iraqi Army Division. Uh, and then the salts were at battalion level, or excuse me, brigade level. So I went to 3rd Brigade, 1st Iraqi Army Division. My salt lead was working with the brigade uh, mid team that was that was advising that brigade staff, and then I was going to get pushed down to first battalion, third brigade. Uh, so I spent a, a couple of days in Hamania with uh, my salt lead, who is a phenomenal F eighteen pilot, uh, really highly regarded in the F eighteen community. Actually, I think if he has it turned over, he's just about to turn over command of an F eighteen squadron. Um, so. You know, learned a ton from him. Like he was going through, like this is how we do clearance of fires. This is how everything works, um, and gave me a little bit of a rundown on on the where I was going. Um, and the place I was going was outside of Habanina. It was a, a combat outpost called uh, OK Corral, uh, which was a, an app name because um, those guys for a while had just had a reputation of being under siege. Um, it was uh, where the Euphrates River pushes west between Fallujah and Ramadi. Mm-hmm. You have this kind of green zone on the north side of the Euphrates, and that's essentially where it was. And the problem was it was kind of the, with the insurgents in Ramadi, it always kind of considered their like R&R area. Uh-huh. So you go take a break from the fighting, and then you know this Iraqi battalion with its advisors pushes up into their area. And they were literally just on the other side of the river from uh, Chaldea, like right across the bridge. You, you drive across, we call it the 611 bridge uh, in Chaldea, you drive across the river on the 611 bridge and you pretty much drive right into the, the gate of the cop. But, uh, I mean, they were just absolutely under fire, uh, from day one that they set that thing up. Um, so they're telling me about this, like, Hey, you're going to roll into this place. Like they just got attacked by a, a bongo truck with a 14.5 millimeter in the back yeah. last week. Um, you know, the, the, uh, they had some SEALs that would occasionally rotate out and train the Iraqis uh, scout too. And so they had a house that was dedicated inside the cop for the SEALs to live in. They call it the, you know, the SEAL house. Uh, and that's where the Anglico team lived at the time. And then a mortar round, you know, like shacked that thing one night and blew a hole in the roof. And so Jeez. They, they moved the Anglico guys in with the rest of the mint after that. Um, so I'm going through all this and learning from uh, Brad about all the ins and outs. Uh, and sitting and watching them do, you know, ISR. Um, and then they pushed me across the river to wake up with my team. Uh, and I ripped out with uh, Bo Bowden, who was the the uh, comm chief at the time. The nice thing about ripping out with the comm chief is he had all the Gucci toys. Yeah. <laughs> um, like, I was the only fic, I think, in country that had a rover. Uh, most of the rovers were at salt level, which, for those who don't know, a rover is a, it's a kit that allows me to see the, the feed from the aircraft's targeting pod, like for a jet, and they've got a targeting pod. I can actually see what they're looking at through the rover system because they'll yeah. broadcast that. Um, that grainy black and white video, yeah. I mean, it's, it seemed pretty awesome at the time. Oh, it's only gotten better and better. <laughs> yeah. Um, but again, I was I think I was the only fake in the country that had one. Um, the salts mostly had them. Um, but the way Brad kind of worked the salt was, you know, with the other, there were, you know, he had two fix. I was with first battalion and Chris Pate was with second battalion. And what he told us is you, you're almost like a, you know, like you're, you're an observer. Like you go out with patrols, you get out uh, as much as you can, uh, where the point of friction is. And when they're in contact, like, you know, we know brief stack mark control. He's basically like, Hey, I'll handle stack. You know, you guys only worry about, and, and frankly, you don't necessarily even have to worry about brief. Like, if you don't want to, just tell me where you are and where the enemy is, and I'll I'll do the brief, and you just clear it hot. Yeah. Um, trying to take as much off of us as possible, because he had the rover feed, uh, and he could get SA back that way. And, you know, we, when we were out dismounted, we wouldn't have the feed with us. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, figuring out how all that worked. You know, I get out with 
uh, rip out with Bo. He takes off pretty quickly. Uh, get to know the team a little bit. Um, and the funny thing was, like, so Brad had said, like, hey, you know, I'm back at Habania. My guys aren't getting shot at. Like, it's pretty easy back here. If you want to re- send your guys back and I'll push my guys forward to replace them for like a week, uh, we could do that. Like, all right, cool. That sounds like a great, great offer. So I get out there and, you know, meet with my guys. Like, hey, just to let you know, this offer's on the table. If you want to go back to Habania and chill out for a week or so, you could do that. And they're all like, nah, we're good. Like we like we like being here. We're we're in the shit. This is what we signed up to do. We're gonna stay here. Um, it's like, all right, cool. So we start pushing out on patrols pretty much right away. So I mentioned, you know, this this cop is just on the north side of the river, and we like maybe control like 500 meters outside the cop. Like anything outside of that's bad guy country. But the Iraqis had a plan, or the, probably the MIT had a plan. To start, you know, we had a, a road, when you follow the 611 bridge north, you're on this road called Route Duster. Uh, and Duster was, you know, you have a color-coded system of danger for each road. Duster was black, like, don't don't drive on Duster. Mm-hmm. You're going to get killed. Um, and just IEDs everywhere on that road. So they had a plan to start pushing out along Duster to try to start building some security out out from there. So what they did was they started building these fortified towers along Duster about every click or click and a half. Um, and so that's the first stop when I get there. Like, hey, we're going we're gonna to go out and we're going to build these towers. And it's going to be this major operation. We're going to have air on station while they're building, while the engineers are building these things. We're going to have overwatch positions with, you know, up, up gun Humvees and everything else. Mm-hmm. Like, all right, cool. So I'm, I'm going right into the shit. Um, and we start going on patrols right away. Um, and I mentioned earlier, like the guys that were training me back in camp was you and said, like, don't take your camel back. You're going to have bottled water and a Humvee with a, you know, a, uh, a cooler in the back. Like I had none of that. Uh, I did more dismounted patrolling on that deployment, you know, which is a five month deployment as an Anglico team leader than I did in my previous three years in an infantry. Uh, awesome. It was constant, uh, tons of dismounted patrolling. And, you know, all in 120, 130 degree heat, which is amazing. Yeah, Iraq in the summertime. Yeah, when they say it's a dry heat, it is not in Habania. Uh, it was absolutely humid there. And oh, not, yeah, not Camp, Lake Habania. Yeah, not Camp Lejeune humid, but there were definitely some spots that were just steamy. Yeah. Um, so we start pushing out on patrols and just getting just gassed uh, right off the bat. Um, and I remember early on, if we push out, we set an OP to watch him build one of these towers. And I'm listening on the radio as, as Brad's working some ISR with uh, some F-18s. And he had this great system. He had tracked enough activity around that he would built NAIs. Like, he knew that this area, like, they like, this was a problem with cash site. They always came to this spot. Mm-hmm. So he had, had it labeled. And he had the system to go scan these NAIs and, um, we took a ton of indirect fire, but they always did it from the same crew sites. So we had these like four or five habitual point of origin sites where they always shot from. Yeah. And that's kind of how he identified these cache sites. He'd, he'd see a vehicle leave that poo site, track it to this house. We're like, okay, I'm going to mark that down and keep track of that. That's the, that keeps some, that house might be worth looking at later. Yeah. Um, so we're sitting on this OP mm-hmm. one day. And I'm listening to him work this, and he's watching an AI. The vehicle leaves the NAI and starts driving. The guy, cool, will they drive to one of the, the poo sites? Like, okay, this could get interesting. They start taking stuff out of the back of the vehicle. And uh, and he's watching the rover feed. He's like, that's a tube. They just took some kind of tubular object out of the back of that vehicle. I'm calling that a mortar tube. And he had the, the brigade advisor, a lieutenant colonel right there, and so he's like, hey, I'm calling out a mortar team. And the, the lieutenant colonel's like, yep, agreed. You're approved. Strike those guys. And the pilots, uh, it was a F-18 section. They're like, ah, we don't know, man. We don't feel good about this. We want to drop down for a closer look. So they drop down to like 5,000 feet. And, of course, you know, the, the bad guys hear them. You know, they set up their mortar. They've got their mortar tube set up by the time they do this. These guys drop down to 5,000. And so they, they hear that and they immediately drop rounds and pack up mm-hmm. and go. Um, and uh, so I'm listening to all this and then I hear the, you know, the boom 
in the distance from them dropping around. So you, they're probably shooting at us. Um, my radio operator at the time had, uh, he'd laid out on the roof and he'd taken his helmet off and he had his helmet underneath his head as a pillow. And we hear the outgoing rounds. He just picks his head up, puts his helmet on his head and puts his head back down. <laughs> goes right back to sleep. Um, enjoying the day. Yeah. I mean, 120 degree day on a rooftop in Iraq and the sun, no shade. There's not much more uh, you can do there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we had a parapet, like it was a solid Iraqi, uh, you know, uh, center block construction with rebar and everything. Like unless they were landed around on the rooftop, which is a pretty low, low chance of that. We were fine. What kind of so, attacks were you guys seeing in that area? Was it, was it a lot of IDF? Was it IEDs a lot? Or were, were you getting into some small arms engagements and stuff? So by the time I got there, it was almost entirely IEDs and indirect fire. A uh, ton of IEDs, a lot of indirect fire. Although the month before I got there, they were supposedly they were the most heavily mortared base in all of Iraq the month before I got there. Um, they did that. take, yeah, they did have uh, a lot of direct fire before I arrived. Uh, it had kind of dropped off by the time I got there. So the, the mid team was all pulled from, third battalion fifth marines and they were all infantry guys uh, and they were all fallujah vets they'd all been in the battle of fallujah uh so i mean these guys were i mean they were gunfighters um they all had 203s every single one of them had a 203 and they all carried a boatload of 40 millimeter uh and every time they got in contact they just started volleying 203 rounds and maneuvering and literally, you know, I mean, there's there's two MIT guys with every Iraqi patrol. They would, they had two advisors per Iraqi company, and so when an Iraqi company would go on patrol, they'd have two two advisors go along. And usually, what happened, they get into contact, and the Iraqis would all like go hide, and it'd be these two Marines like bounding, firing, and moving mm-hmm. towards the enemy, you know, launching two or threes. And uh, after a while, the enemy just had enough of it, so they they generally kind of stayed away from direct fire when the Marines were around. Um, and so a matter of fact, uh, a later incident, like they, they did an S2 analysis of a later incident, trying to determine if Marines were targeted. And I remember one of the S2s came back and was like, actually all the reporting we've seen is they actually try to avoid the Marines. I've heard that before too, about some, because the, yeah, cause the Marines come after them. So, yeah. With heavy uh, gunfire. Yeah. Yeah. They'd rather hit the Iraqis when the Marines aren't around. Um, but yeah, a lot of a lot of IEDs. Um, like an IED. I mean, it got to the point by a couple of months in that deployment, it got to where I could identify if it was an IED or if it was a mortar, and generally where it was just by the sound of it. Um, we actually had a day. I was working NTISR, uh, sorry, Intel surveillance. You know, basically just scanning around with the aircraft uh, one day from the COC. You know, and my salt lead was on the line too. We were just kind of passing the aircraft back and forth, looking at different things. And I heard a boom off in the distance. I was like, "Hey, Brad, you need to you need to check with Third Battalion because that was an IED in their AO." Mm-hmm. I was like, "Nah, we're not hearing anything for Third Battalion. That's nothing, man." I'm like, "No, I'm telling you, that was an IED in their AO." And like 15 minutes go by, and he comes back and he grabs the aircraft from me. I was like, "Hey, I need you to go slew to this location." Uh, apparently third battalion just had uh, a vehicle get IED. It's like, dude, I told you. Yeah. <laughs> told you that was an IED in third battalion's AO. Uh, and it was, uh, it was an American vehicle that got hit. It was the only American vehicle in that patrol and they got, it, it flipped the Humvee over completely. Uh, and so all their comms were down. So that's why they didn't hear anything. Um, and ended up, um, like none of the Americans died, as I remember. Like the, the the Iraqis actually like they had a really sharp Iraqi officer with them who grabbed the American casualty, shoved him in one of his vehicles, and took him back to TQ to get treated. Nice. Yeah. Um, and then uh, they actually, after everybody left, they caught some of the insurgents trying to. They like to go back and backlay, like pull yeah. IEDs, old shot holes, and actually caught some dudes trying to trying to back lay an IED back into that shot hole uh, about an hour or so later and ran a strafe pass on it with the uh, Harriers. But, uh, They're persistent yeah, was, like that, man. They're persistent, you know, doing yeah. stuff like that. I mean, it was just nuts so that you could just learn to identify what it was. Uh, 
you know, when the, the new MIT team started to roll in and we had a, there was an IED on Duster, you know, the Iraqis went on patrol and an IED went off and you always, you knew how to tell you heard the ID. And then the next thing we, you know, the interpreters live with us. So you, they had a radio on the Iraqis frequency. So you'd hear the ID and you'd listen for the Iraqis and you'd listen to see if they started babbling on their, their comms. And if they started, you know, going back, you know, just really going off on comms, like you knew something bad happened, mm-hmm. start getting ready for a medevac or something. But if nothing, if you didn't hear anything, then okay, it's, it's, they probably didn't get hit that bad. And so, you know, we're sitting in the, the Marine house one day, just watching TV or something. And there's a boom. And we listen. And we don't hear anything on the Iraqi channel. Like, all right, it's nothing. One of the uh, the new mid-team guys that was ro- rotating in had been in the, the wag bag shooter. He comes, comes rolling in with a wag bag, full of his own IED, uh, <laughs> in, into the middle of the marine house. Like, what was that an incoming? Like, dude, chill. It's an IED on Duster. The Iraqis aren't freaking out. It's probably nothing. Go get rid of that thing. Get out yeah, of here. I throw that in the yeah. pit. Yeah. Um. But yeah, so a ton of that going on. Uh, a little bit of indirect fire. Some effective. Like, I mean. The, one of the three five guys that went home on their advon, like I remember, he was standing outside the COC. He walked into the COC to talk to somebody, and then there was just this god awful boom right outside this. I mean, I was, I think I was on the hook with an aircraft when it hit, uh, and I remember like just cursing because this thing hit and just rocked all our worlds. And uh, it was a one twenty round right outside the COC, and, and Anderson walked out. He's like, "Dude, I was standing right where that thing hit." Close calls, man. Those close yeah. calls. It's like that's my sign, deuces. Uh, it's time to leave. Do you want to um, explain kind of um, the breakup of your firepower control team, like how how they were organized, yeah. and then what their individual roles were during this deployment? Because a lot of people they always hear about the JTAC and stuff like that, but can you you want to go into a little bit more detail about what a a firepower control team is and and how they were employed? Yeah, no, that's a great point because, like, like you bring up, and I'm sure you experienced a lot of units. When they see an Anglico team, they see JTAC. Yeah, we don't want any other guys. Just send us to JTAC. Yeah. yeah, dude, I have three other guys who are all very capable. Yeah. Uh, so, firepower control team is uh, it's the lowest level of Anglico team. They're designed to attach to a company of uh, either joint or coalition force and provide them a link into the Marine Corps fire support system, right? Access to Marine Corps aviation and fire support. Mm. And really in today's day and age, really it's joint, joint fire support and joint uh, close air support capabilities. Um, so the team leader is a captain, uh, supposed to be by TO and artillery officer. You know, obviously in my case, I was a infantry officer. I've heard of pilots being thick leads. I've never, personally seen it but i've heard of it happening yeah we, um, we had it at first and then within the team you have a, a sergeant team chief who's supposed to be a 0861 ford observer i have occasionally seen a com guy team chief but mm-hmm. uh not not often uh you're supposed to be a ford observer and they usually have uh, you know by to is supposed to be two two com guys and two ford observers including the, the team chief uh in our time frame, we didn't have enough for five, so it was usually a four-man team. Um, and it depended. Some teams had two comm guys. Some teams had two FOs. Um, my case, I had – my team chief was the FO, uh, and then I had two comm guys. Mm-hmm. Uh, so my uh, my team chief was – he'd been – this was his second deployment as an FO. You know, JFO wasn't a thing then. Uh, the Marine Corps had not signed on for the GFO program, so we didn't have any GFOs, but he had been trained. So in the whole, I mentioned Matt Moyer's team leader had that incident. The company, as part of the investigation, had stood up this program called Qualified Observer, uh, and it was basically like GFO, an in-house GFO program, mm-hmm. before anybody knew what a GFO was. Um, and there was a series of training standards that were developed. And you, if you wanted a guy to be a qualified observer, you had to put him through a week of classes. And they had to go demonstrate they could, you know, locate their own position, locate a target position, et cetera, yeah. uh, be able to mark a target, do provide certain things. Um, and so my, my team chief got trained up as a qualified observer. I think a couple of the guys did as well. 
so he was pretty sharp. Um, and then my comm guys were, were both pretty sharp. Like I, I remember one of them. So after we built these towers on Duster and we made Duster safe enough to drive on for at least a few kilometers, we started running mounted patrols on Duster every day. And we would do like three, four, five mounted patrols on these things a day. And the MIT in the beginning would always go out with the Iraqis. And there were so few MIT guys that what we started doing, you know, we, we didn't want to push a single MIT Humvee uh, by itself for, you know, I mentioned the one that got blown up by itself in mm-hmm. third battalion that, you know, nobody had comms because the only American Humvee got blown up. Yeah. So for that very reason, we didn't want to send a, a single American Humvee by itself. So we'd always send two Humvees, but with so few guys to man it, we would only man driver and gutter. So if you were driving, you were in the turret uh, and the driver was running the radios. Oh, um, really? That's crazy. And me being, you know, so all the MIT guys, all the officers on the MIT team had Humvee licenses, but Anglico didn't do that. So I didn't have a Humvee license. Um, so my, you know, whoever rolled. And I remember rolling out with. Uh, oh, hold on. Say that with, again. Uh, one you of my said... radio operators. And we had to. Oh, I think we got, I got cut off from you there for a second. You said that yeah. you didn't, you didn't have a Humvee license and then I, I lost you. Yeah, so if, if whenever I rolled out with one of my guys, I always had to be in the turret, and you know, one of my guys would drive, mm-hmm. um, since I wasn't supposed to drive. So we're, I were rolling out one day, and I had air on station, and we needed to roll to the alternate TAD, and we had a 119. Uh, I think it was a 119 Alpha, so you know, oh, it's got wow. the, the keypad on it. I was like, hey, Gerardi, hey, we need to roll to Cherry whatever, our alternate TAD. And he's driving on Duster at about 35 miles an hour, 40 miles an hour, through serpentines and everything else. And he doesn't even look at it. He flips the switch to load, plugs in the new frequency, hits stow, flips it back. He's like, all right, you're good, sir. Didn't even look at the faceplate once. Doing it on the move. That's that's how you know he's been yeah. doing it a lot. Um, I mean, we ran – so we didn't have any sort of uh, – like the only internet we had was the unclassified stuff, the Nippernet. Mm-hmm. Uh, so the only way I had to send my classified products back to my salt was over SATCOM, over uh, HPW, which HPW, I'm sure you know. Yeah. Yep. Um, so, I mean, and I never had to do anything with that. Like, you know, my two com guys always kept that stuff up and running. Yeah, same. Yeah. I know the words, but I don't know what the hell they're, <laughs> you know, they, so, they know how to make the magic happen. Next deployment was not the same. I had to learn how to, to load crypto and do everything to get my HBW up and running on the next deployment. Uh, yeah. But uh, on this first one, man, they, those two guys had it down pat. Um, you can't beat some of the Anglico radio operators, you know? No, nah, man, they were, they were solid. But we just, like I said, we did a ton of foot patrols. Um, once we kind of built that bubble out through with the towers that we built, we would a lot of times we'd take a vehicle patrol out to a tower and then we'd foot patrol from there. Um, we had a couple of days. So we had, we knew like the zero, zero northing was kind of our line. We knew if you went north of the zero, zero, you're getting out of fight. Mm-hmm. Somebody was going to come after you. Um, Cause we, where the river was, it would proceed north. Uh, it it kind of bent. You know, our cop was, the river ran east to west and then it kind of turned and went north. And so we kind of went up north along the river uh, and then where it kind of went back to the west was this town called Abu Bali, which was just straight bad guy country. Um, and so if we pushed up in Abu Bali, we were getting out of fight. Um, but we started pushing up there more and more. Uh, we actually had an op where second recon was doing some stuff on the other side of the river. And they wanted us to push into Abu Bali and interdict the bad guys for them. And, uh, so we started going up into there a good bit. Um, and the problem was we're, we're route duster followed the river. Like he kept getting closer and closer to the river. And so it got narrower and narrower on that side. But on the other side, on the east side of Duster, the canals were all like just super deep. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm sure you're familiar with the big irrigation canals. And yeah. like we took a patrol up there one day on like a 130 degree day. I had this fat Iraqi lieutenant colonel behind me in the patrol. And I had to haul him out of every canal. Oh, yeah. Trying yeah, to get in and... <laughs> Just wallow around a little bit, trying to cool off. No, I just couldn't get up the side. You know, oh, buddy, coming up the other side. 
the other embankment. So I had to turn and you know, grab him and pull him up every single time. That's funny. And I'm just getting crushed. Um, and so the Iraqis figured out, hey, if we go on the west side of Duster, the canals are all really shallow over there. It's really easy to jump over them. No big deal. Mm-hmm. But it get, like I said, it gets really narrow. So there's only so many crossing points. Mm-hmm. And you end up taking all the same crossing points over and over again. Or again, they like get on a bridge. Yeah. They take the same bridge again and again. And so sure enough, like, I mean, any, any Marine knows what happens. You do that a couple of days. Uh, you take the same crossing points. And, uh, you know, the bad guys start putting IEDs on. And I sent my team chief on a patrol. It just, so we would, we would do split team ops where, you know, I would take a radio operator one day and then Bones would take another radio operator another day. Um, and so he's out one day with one of these patrols and they go up the same way on the, the west side. And like the June day, like two or three guys in front of him just gets vaporized. Oh, uh, crap. Yeah, and the good thing, like unlike Afghanistan, these guys weren't really good at putting IDs into, like off of the roads. Mm-hmm. They would put them in soft soil where they would sink down low. They would command down them. So usually, if you weren't directly on top of it, you were okay. Um, but yeah, like the guy, like two guys in front of him, just disappears. Um, and so, and and Tressler, my team chief, like he got his bell rung pretty good by that one and so he came back from that patrol and he's like hey you know that that whole that offer to go back to Habania for a week is that still on the table <laughs> yeah man we'll, we'll make that happen um so we had to rotate him out um for a week or so um the MIT started getting hit pretty hard with IEDs around this time um they had one guy that actually got evac'd out of country because he had so many grade three concussions he just he had to go he had like 12 IDs on That's that. That's crazy, man. Um, we had the new uh, jamming systems on our Humvees, but at that point, you know, they were uh, they were so new and they, had, they hadn't they had figured out the integration with the comm system. So if the jamming system was on, you couldn't talk more than like oh, 50 to 100 meters. That sucks. And so he pulled up on, I think it was actually at Medevac one day. Like he was going out to Kazovac somebody with the Iraqis. They stopped. He turned off the jammer to get a comm check, and they set off an ID right next to the Humvee uh, while he was in the turret. And I remember talking to the major afterwards. He's like, "Yeah, we got to send this guy back. Like his head's like an eggshell right now." Um, yeah, for sure. There's only so many of those blasts you can take. Yeah, yeah. We had a guy, um, the three six, who I think he was the lead vehicle commander. He was like a corporal for the uh, battalion commanders. Uh, you know, protection team, whatever it's called. And uh, I think he hit like six IEDs, including stepping on one. Uh, that gotcha. just is low order debt, you know, instead of actually exploding, I think it just caught on fire. But it was like, dude, don't get near that guy <laughs> or like don't yeah. ride with that guy. I mean, he had the mine roller on the front of his truck. So, I mean, I guess it was kind of doing its thing, but still at the same time, it's like, dude, there's only that's got to mess with you after a while, you know, even if it's a few that are low order debt, just the nerves, like, I don't know. I think it would fuck with me. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I was fortunate that not too many of those went off on patrols that I was on. Um, I mean, they hit the vehicles a good bit. Even though we had the towers out, they were still able to sneak in IEDs. Mm. Just not as many along yeah. the road. Um, I got, you know, they shot mortars at it. We think there was somebody out there with a 60 millimeter mortar that was shooting handheld at us. Because uh, every now and again, he pop one off at us. We went to Abu Bali one day. And I remember coming back, and we had air on station as we were leaving. Um, and I had the F-18s, like, scan behind us. I was like, hey, focus on Duster behind us as we go, because these guys are going to try to do something behind us as we're, we're heading south. And uh, and I, I was dumb. I had I had let my radio operator not take the 119 out. And all I had was a, a 148 and a biter to talk to the aircraft. And it had been working great mm-hmm. up to that point. Um and I'm listening. He's like, yeah, I see a vehicle coming uh, south. It's just stop. They're, they're messing around. They're getting some stuff out. And my salt leads in his COC, listen to all this. And, uh, you know, we're, we're just patrolling through. An, we're in an open field as I'm listening to all this. And then we hear the pop. And we all take off running for the tree line for cover. And, uh, you know, these guys had gotten out and popped off a 60 mortar at us in handheld. And, uh, I start trying to scream in the handset like, hey, that dude just shot at us, and the, the aircraft can't hear me. 
Uh, he's not getting anything. And I can hear him talking to my salt lead, to Brad. And he's like, oh, man, look, those guys are – that's weird. They just all piled in the vehicle. They're driving really crazy right now. Like, they're just – they're ripping down this road really fast. And I'm trying to scream like that's cause they just shot at us. Yeah. Uh, and those dudes totally got away. I got back and got on the phone with Brad and was like, dude, those guys totally shot a mortar at us. He's like, Oh man, I was wondering why they were driving so crazy. It's like, that's yeah, next time don't, don't, don't rely on an empire. You idiot. Yeah. For yeah, sure. Thanks. Um, they did a couple other incidents like that with mortars where they just popped off random sixties at us. Um, they hit the, the cop a fair amount. We, the cop had a, or coming out most of a big water tower on it. It just made a, a perfect aiming stake yeah. for those guys. Easy to aim out for sure. Yeah. Um, and it, it was a lot of that going on. Um, it started to drop off by end of July. We did some, uh, we did some air assault. We actually did a, a nighttime air assault with the National Guard Black Hawk unit. Like we loaded the Iraqis in Black Hawks. Mm hmm. And uh, flew with this Virginia National Guard unit up into Abu Bali, like way behind, essentially behind enemy lines. Like they had no idea we were there. Yeah. Iraqis totally walked up on a, a group of like a couple of guys in a vehicle that had an ID in the back of the, in the trunk. They were going to lay in an ID somewhere and had absolutely no idea that there were Iraqi and American forces in their neighborhood. So they got stopped. Uh, you know, they got detained and their, their vehicle got destroyed. Um and I mean, it, we caught them so off guard that we didn't get attacked at all uh, on our way out. This, the, there was a seal element that flew in too. They kind of stayed as like an overwatch as we left. Uh, and I think they got into a gunfight after we got out. But it, it caught the enemy so off guard um, that they had no idea that we were up there. That was a, a good lesson as a JTAC back then. Because uh, I'm sure you've seen a lot of JTACs. Like when we start talking on the radio to aircraft, you. You kind of get in your head. You start yeah. paying it. Stop paying attention to, to your surroundings. Yeah, and you get I, real I, focused on whatever it is that you're like thinking about at the time. Yeah. Yeah, and I have a tendency to pace too when I talk to aircraft. Mm -hmm. um, I've actually busted my ass in New Jersey on ice because I was pacing and wore down the snow and you know packed it into ice. Um, but I was doing that in Abu Bali. It was still like sun hadn't come up yet. It was still dark, and I was talking to a section F-18s. I was pacing, not paying attention. And I, we were inside a house, and I walked out the front door of the house, and there was, you know, a little light behind me, so I'm completely backlit. And this uh, this gunny from the mitt reaches out of the shadows and grabs the back of my flak and, like, drags me back inside. He's like, sir, you're killing me? Like, I just dragged the major inside. <laughs> now you're stupid officers. That's like, yeah, you got me, gunny. That's totally legit. Um, so... I mean, that was a, that was an interesting hop, but I mean, nothing, no drops in that or nothing came of it. Just a lot of walking and sweating. Did you find it uh, weird coming back from a deployment with like an Anglico team where you're, you're in your small element and you're an attachment to another force and then like linking back up with all your dudes? Like, how was it coming back? How much different was it coming back with your Anglico guys than it was coming back with like your infantry battalion? I mean, it was like everybody had completely different experiences. So mm -hmm. it was cool to come back and like, hey, you know, what did you do, man? Like, what did you learn? Mm -hmm. um, we actually did a pretty good AAR back at al Assad. Like, we brought everybody in like, hey, let's just start bullshitting and talking about what you, what you learned. Because we learned a, you know, a ton of Habanilla about certain things. The guys in Ramadi uh, were in this heavily urban area. They, they saw completely different things. Like, we were, we were in a completely rural area. Like, we were. Like I know the second battalion mid team had, had changed over into green camis because they were everything was green around us. Yeah. Um, so the guys in Ramadi had a completely different experience. They were humping along like you know one of their guys was had like fourteen magazines on him because they were getting in Jeez. gunfights, but they were also fairly close to the fob, so they weren't going that far. Um, whereas me, like I was dropping mags and adding smokes. Like I, by the end, I was carrying like three mags and yeah. like four or five smokes. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, just because we weren't getting in that many gunfights. And if, if we were, like, it wasn't my job to shoot back. It was my job to, to do other things. So um, comparing notes on that stuff like that, like we had one guy uh, who had gotten really good at spotting IEDs, uh, like the, the thermal signature of IEDs and roads. So he gave a good brief on, like, what he did to, to figure out how to spot those. Um, 
had pretty good success getting IDs, picking them out and getting them pulled up by a route clearance. Um, so a lot of that going on. Um, it was just a good learning experience in general. Like I, I, I learned more from my salt lead uh, than I did in all the TCP school. Just, just learning how to like, how to talk on a radio. Um, it's interesting. Like ground guys, we think pilots are all just pro speak on the radio all the time, mm-hmm. um, and you learn that there's very much a, an etiquette for them of like, hey, it's it's definitely bro speak and trucker talk. Like when nothing's going on, but once it's once things start happening, like it's all game face. Like it's all professional. Yeah. Pilots um, are really good about turning it on when it's go time. And I got, he, he actually, my salt league counseled me one day cause I was out on a patrol, you know, and you get used to talking to these pilots and just bullshitting with them all the time. And just, and, uh, I was out on patrol or out on, uh, you know, the Iraqis were out and they'd gotten into a firefight and, uh, there was an Iraqi vehicle near us with a PKM that had shot off a burst, like in completely the wrong direction, like across the river. Uh, and I had been talking on the radio when he did it. So the pilot heard it. He's like, ah, oh, you know, I hear some, sounds like machine gun fire on the radio. And I was like, yeah, it's just bitch be cool fire from the Iraqis. Oh. And so I got back and Brad's like, hey, uh-uh. You do that was troops in contact. There's no bitch be cool fire, none of that. Over yeah. The radio. Yeah, you're getting it's, a little too loose all professional once uh, it's game on. So I mean, that was a good lesson for me that I took, uh, took with me. Well, I mean, and also when you have like a pilot there, it's almost like, you know, I used to try to send my guys down to the gun line to get some time there because it gives you a better understanding of what's happening on that end. That way when you're, you know, the fire support expert and the commanding officer or whoever, the authority, you know, approval authority sitting there like, hey, what's going on with this mission? you can kind of be like, well, they're probably doing this. You know, you have a better understanding of what is actually happening. And like at Anglico, when you have pilots there all the time and you're constantly talking with them about what they do and a variety of pilots from all platforms, you definitely get a better understanding of what's happening in the cockpit. Hey, he's probably in a turn right now. Give him a second. Hey, you can't see anything because the pod is just, you know, it's covered by the wing. Give it a second. You know, these different things that, oh, hold on, we're just not talking because he's briefing his two to make sure he's, you know, on the same, you know, they're on the same target and all that stuff. It's all that little stuff that you start picking up that makes you, like, really good at your job and, you know, quickens the kill chain and you become very efficient, you know, for that commanding officer. Yep. Um, Yeah, there's a ton of learning on that. Um, I will say, like, coming back together, so I would be remiss not to mention, so while we were on that deployment, um, I got there in – mid-May, uh, and the, the team leader was 2nd Battalion. I was with 1st Battalion. The team leader was 2nd Battalion. It was a guy named Chris Pate. Um, so early July, uh, I think I was actually racked out because I'd been on patrol, but Chris went out on a patrol with the guys from 2nd Battalion. They had a new mid-team ro- rip, uh, rotating in, so he went on patrol with a couple of mid guys. And he actually didn't take any of his, uh, any of his guys from his team along. He actually... Uh, one of them talked about it, said like, hey, they were, one of them was getting ready to gear up and go with him. He's like, no, nah, stay here. Chris had actually been a recon guy. He was a ground intel officer, had been in recon, had gotten off active duty and was in the reserves and had somehow gotten activated as a reservist to join Anglico hmm. and became a JTAC and de- deployed with us as a team leader. Uh, so anyway, he told one of his guys, hey, go do the recon short card. I'll be right back. So they go out on patrol. Uh, and they're on a foot patrol, and they go over and cross a uh, a road, and an ID goes off while they're crossing the road, uh, and uh, gets two of the MIT guys pretty badly. I think they were from three eight. Uh, I think, but like a, an amputation or two. But Chris takes a piece of frag, uh, like misses the armor, and gets him in the torso, uh, and ends up uh, not making it. So he gets medevaced out, but ends up uh, passing away. So, and I, I still remember like getting a call from Brad over the radio, like, Hey man, I want to let you know, like Chris, Chris got killed this morning. Um, and just like taking the air out of everything. Oof, God, that's because Chris was, uh, he's just a really super enthusiastic guy. Like he could, you know, sometimes like I remember Brad kind of getting on his case cause he could sometimes be a little over the top. Uh, but always very positive, very enthusiastic. He was being a ground Intel officer. He was kind of the de facto company S2. Mm-hmm. 
and he was our like he was our maps and falcon view and piss off SME. like he and one of the other guys had developed the piss off certification like there wasn't a formal piss off certification for the the fires guys that know what that is yeah um he like helped develop that for second thing go um and taught us all how to get the imagery and how to do all these things uh and so yeah that was a that was a big kick in the junk for everybody when Chris passed away. And I'm, I'm sure you've, uh, I didn't know, uh, Chris Leon that was killed in Ramadi. I think Matt mentioned it in his podcast. Um, I think those were the first two Anglico Marines, uh, killed in all of the war on terror, uh, with Chris Leon and Chris Pate. Um, if, if guys want to hear more about what happened with Chris Leon, uh, his salt lead was a guy named Chip Burke who is actually working for, I forget the name of the company right now, but it's Jocko Willink's company. Mm-hmm. He works for Jocko, uh, and he has been on Jocko's podcast. Um, oh, if you go look, the pilot? Yeah, Dave Dave Burke is his name. Uh, yeah, yeah. Call sign Chip. Okay. Uh, so if you ever listen to his podcast, he talks about what happened with Chris Leon and Ramadi, because he was in Ramadi with his, his SALT uh, supporting an army unit as well as uh, Jocko's task force or task group or whatever they were task force bruiser. Yeah. I, th- I was actually thinking yeah. about hitting him up and see if he wanted to come on the show. Cause I actually caught that podcast with Jocko and I was like, Oh, this is an Anglico guy, like an F 18 dude. Yeah. He was talking about it. Yep. Yeah, yeah. So, um, we didn't talk about it, but fifth Anglico had just stood up when all this went down. So, you know, usually when the active duty Anglico is deployed, they had a debt from a reserve Anglico that went with them mm-hmm. to augment uh, and essentially give them some more guys. When we deployed, you know, we had our two organic platoons. We also had a platoon from 5th Anglico come over from Okinawa mm-hmm. to deploy with us. Uh, and that was part of their, like, initial operational capability. It was they had one platoon that deployed with 2nd Anglico. And so Chip was part of that crew from 5th Anglico that came over, uh, as was Chris Leon. Um, and so, you know, we get to... You know, when I was at in Habania, it was all second angle two guys. My salt lead was second. Uh, I, you know, my team was all from second. Chris Pate's team was all from second. So when Chris got killed, they pulled him out or pulled his team out um, and then rotated in another team that was from fifth angle co uh, into our salt. And then those guys started operating over there um, towards the end of the deployment. So that was, uh, it was definitely a somber time when we lost him. I bet, man. I can't. I was uh, lucky enough where we didn't lose anybody on my advisor team, you know, on our deployment. But I can't imagine, like, on a small team like that, it's got to be, you know, quite the hit to take some take a casualty. Um, I mean, yeah, it's never easy, but. Yeah, that was the one that I mentioned when I said, like, the S2 did an analysis later and said, hey, we don't think they were actually targeting Americans. They we think it was just target of opportunity. They happened to. The three of them happened to congregate on the road yeah. um, at just the wrong time and at the wrong place. Yeah. Um, yeah. And so Chris Chris actually, I mean, basically after he was wounded, um, he was able to get out a radio call uh, to say, hey, you know, I, I don't know exactly what he was able to say over the radio, but was able to get out a radio call to alert everyone that they've been hit. Um and because of that, they were able to get a medevac to get the other two guys. And so those two guys lived because he was able to get out that last radio call. That's awesome. Um, so, Man, that's tough, dude. That's yeah. tough. I, I'd, I'd, hate to, <clears throat> I'd hate to wrap it up on a story like that, like end it like that. But, you know, um, we're coming up. We're at uh, just over two hours and stuff. It, you know, I don't know, man. That's what can you say about you know every unit's loss is like i think a little bit different you know and only the people that knew that person or in that unit can really like fully appreciate it or understand it and unfortunately after 20 years you know sometimes the names come up and it just becomes an afterthought unfortunately it's just uh that sucks though i can't imagine what that was like you know yeah. we lost guys it's, when i was with three six and stuff we had when we had charlie one six attached to us they lost three guys um, but I didn't know any of them personally or anything like that. The only guys I knew personally that passed away, I wasn't, you know, there for it or anything. So it's, I know it's, that's a different situation altogether. Yeah. He, uh, 
I mean, there, you know, there's limits on reservists on how long they can be activated. He actually had to come back to the States while I was still getting ready, you know, doing the pre-deployment stuff because mm-hmm. his time had run up and they basically said, you will you gotta come back, come and back, the clock. get off of active duty. So he had to like go off of active duty for 30 days and then get back on active duty, fly back to Iraq and rejoin his team. Um, so he was all he about it. it. Yeah. He fought it the whole way. Um, you know, got back over there, rejoined his team and got back into it. Um, yeah, no, it was a tough loss. I mean, we did a, did a memorial ceremony over there at Second Battalion. Um, Do you ever go back over to uh, Second Anglico? They built the, they have a new CP and stuff, right? New command, command post and stuff on Lejeune. Yeah, I've been over there a couple of times. Pretty um, nice. They have a, oh yeah, it's super nice. They've got a massive simulator room upstairs. Um, you know, we used to have OP Lightning, uh, which was our, our bar. Mm-hmm. You know, it's, it was maybe the size of this you know, bedroom that I'm in right now. Um, I think after that deployment, they knocked out a wall and, and like cut the, the S4's office in half to make some more room for the, for the OP. <laughs> As they should. But, yes. Uh, the four was laughing about it. He's like, man, this totally shows where the command's priorities are, that they just cut my office in half to, to make more room for the bar. <laughs> we need uh, more room for the bar, damn it. Yeah. But, uh, yeah, they have they have a massive uh, OP lightning now. Um it's easily like three or four times the size of the old one. And it's nicely done. That's awesome. I, I mentioned when I talked to a couple of this, this team leaders from second, I was like, you guys need to name this after Chris Pate. Uh, but I don't, I don't think it ever got up to sufficient levels. I think they have some pictures of him up and a little bit of a memorial, but I was like, Hey, this, I think they named a gym after Chris Leon, but it's like, Hey, the OP ought to be named after Chris Pate. As far as I know, he's only, second Anglico guy to, to pass away in the war on terror. Yeah, that's awesome. That's um, first Anglico has the Eagle's nest, which is kind of their same thing. They took a, there was an unused office. Oh, my dog is leaning against the camera. There's an unused office that they turned into yeah. the uh, Eagle's nest. He like leaned against the camera. Um, and they're having the Anglico reunion there this fall in October. And yeah. So yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. You also, I had a bunch of people send me that. Um, yeah. So I am planning on going for those that are Anglico guys that are going to that. Yeah. I am planning on going to that. That'll be great. It'd be nice to meet a lot of people that I know, you know, listen to the podcast and stuff, but um, yeah, um, they're going to dedicate one of the rooms there to two of the Anglico Marines that were originally there to, you know, an officer and a staff and CO. Uh, just the right thing to do. You know, p- yeah. p- these guys leave their legacy and there's, you got to m- memorialize them, you know, in some way. So it's, it's a great thing. For that to yeah, happen. dude. I mean, I miss that culture of that unit because it was like they do regular, regular you know PMEs and the OP. You know, everybody brings beer. There was a there's a list of fines. Like you know, they had a mm-hmm. they had the second thing would go uh, emblem on a floor mat in the middle of the room, and like if you you step on the jump wings and you're not a jumper, you get a you owe a twelve pack. And, <laughs> you, know, if you step on the wings and you're only a lead sled, you owe a six pack. Or uh, and the you know, back then, like the the squadrons would contribute. Like if if a if a air crew came out and they dropped without a cleared hot, yeah, you know they they owed beer to the OP. Yeah, uh, you know if you screwed something up on the OP, you you know on the actual OP, uh, you owed beer to the to OP Lightning. Um, and so we'd have good times in there. You know, the CO would do it all the time. Like, hey, bring everybody in, let's go to the OP uh, and do a PME and just talk. Um, and then, you know, after that deployment, like my platoon commander, we do that in the platoon office a lot of times, um, just bring out a six pack of beers and let's just talk. Yeah. That's the way to do it, man. Just kind of let loose and, you know, freaking do an AAR with a beer in your hand, kind of talk through what happened. And, uh, we did a lot of that. We did a lot of work in, in the, uh, in, uh, the Eagle's nest and had beers, you know, while we're sitting there just bullshitting or, or we're done with a field op and everything's, you know, put away and everything's cleaned up. It's like have a beer, kind of do one last AAR before we send everybody yeah. home kind of deal. Yeah, it's great. And I don't know, the drinking culture, yeah, you can say it's a bad thing or whatever. But I think it's also a camaraderie thing that's uh, – Yeah. There's good and bad. As long, as long as you're not – you know, they're not encouraging like in sh- craziness. We had probably – one of the biggest mistakes they did 
I don't know how it got approved, but somehow our MWR reps or something like that convinced the CEO at First Angle Co. to do a beer pong tournament, that they should <laughs> be able to do a beer pong tournament in the Eagle's Nest. And they did it. And um, it was highly successful or highly popular. And then one of the, I think someone got a DUI after the beer pong tournament. After So yeah. that was the last yeah, time they yeah. did that. But it was like, you know, that's cool that he even did it. You know, most, most Lieutenant Colonels, aren't going to be like, yeah, I authorize it. And I'm here for it. Like they were there, you know, yeah. chucking balls with them and stuff. It's funny, but that's what you get at Anglico sometimes. But yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, man, like I said, we're, we're just probably about almost two hours and 15 minutes. And it, I think it's a good place to kind of pull back here and we can have you come back on again and talk about, you know, <laughs> you're getting close to retirement. So once you sign that paperwork and, you know, fully retired, then we can get all the real secrets out of you. Now you're no yeah. longer <laughs> the company, yeah. man. Well, I'm still going to be a contractor, so I mean, I get some little bit of hooks in me. So, yeah, yeah, for sure. Pretty clear, so watch out for it. But, uh, yeah, I mean, that's already starting to like, all right, I mean, what are they going to do? I'm not getting another fit rep uh, at this point. So Yeah, I mean, just enjoy your last days, man. Like, congrats on your retirement and stuff like that. When's it official? Uh, so I'm doing a little funky because I got a job in the area. Uh, so I didn't, I didn't need to start terminal so early. So what I'm doing is I'm starting leave next week. Um, and I'm just taking annual leave and PTAD here in the area, mm-hmm. but I'll still be like, you know, the only advantage to terminal at this point is I could stop shaving and cut my hair. Yeah. Uh, so I'm going to wait to start terminal until May 21st when I actually do my retirement ceremony. So oh, okay. I'll pick up, pick up my DD 214, you know, get the new ID card, all that on May 21st. And I'll have about a, a week. I have about 10 days of terminal at that point. And then I'll start the new job June 1st. Then you'll truly be a former action guy. And it'll be appropriate yeah. that you're on the podcast. Dude, I've been a former action guy for a while now. <laughs> yeah, once you hit that staff level, it just kind of it gets less and less cool from there. Yeah. yeah. And I was lucky like, I got to hang on to the, the JTAC thing for a while. But that was my, like, my one little link to co- doing cool stuff. Hey, you know what? We got it better than most. Not Almost nobody can say they were a JTAC in the Marine Corps. So that's one thing we got on everybody else. All right, man. Well, I appreciate you coming on. Um, unless you got anything else, I'd, we'll go ahead and wrap it up. And uh, again, you know, thanks for coming on to the show. Um, you don't really put your social media out there. People can hit me up at Kramer Graphics on Instagram at former action guys. Also my website, jkramergraphics.com. Still got stuff up for sale on there. If you're emailing me and I haven't got back to you, and if it's been a little bit, shoot me an email. I got a little behind because it's been finals week or uh, midterms and job searching and everything else the end of my college career in a couple months i'll be done here with the school so hit me up there and uh i think that's really it i hope uh, everybody enjoyed this episode and charlie benbo will have you back on again here in the future cool cool man see you